great afternoon, everyone. This is take two. Uh, Christian wanted to make sure that I got an opportunity to get a practice run in on the first time. Welcoming you all. So I just want to welcome you all to our Pensacola Habitat's annual housing summit. This year, we're going to be talking about the housing continuum, bridging the gap. Uh, my name is Al Henderson. I am currently the Chief Operating Officer for Pensacola Habitat for Humanity. We got a wonderful lineup today. We have one particular speaker who is our keynote speaker who will be speaking to you next. Then we have three local functioning practitioners who will, will, who will be bringing their interesting take on what they see and what they see as important in the community. So Christian has said I only have five minutes. So I will make sure that I will be brief and quick. I need to make sure I go over a few housekeeping rules. One of the things is we're going to be doing a Q&A and with that Q&A, at the end of Chuck's speech, he's going to actually have a Q&A in about, tw about 20 minutes. Uh, so you'll have an opportunity to enter inside of the chat box your Q&A. If you see something in a uh, Q&A that has already been asked, just hit the like button. And what we'll do is we'll add, make sure we ask those questions because we know there's some burning questions for you all. The other uh, participants other than Paige will still be on at the end of the program. And what we'll do is have a Q&A for everyone who's still on. But still, as, as we go throughout and those questions pop up, make sure you hit the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and submit your questions. Without further ado, I would like to move forward by opening us up in a, a word of prayer. Oh, gracious Father, I come to you with a bowed heart and humble head. Heart, bowed head and humble heart. I pray a bold prayer asking that you will be in our midst today, that you will guide us in today's discussion as we take a close look at the housing continuum of care and explore opportunities our community can bridge the gap from homelessness to home ownership. Father, your ministry calls for this organization to hold steadfast to the mission of ensuring every single human being has a safe and decent place to live. My prayer today is that you would provide us the knowledge, resources, strength, and most of all, Father God, the courage to do your, your bold work. All these blessings we ask in the Son of Jesus' name, Lord, amen. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Charles Moron, known as Chuck to friends and colleagues, is the founder and president of Strong Towns and the author of Strong Towns, a bottom-up revolution to rebuild American prosperity. He is a professional engineer and a land use planner with two decades of experience. He holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master of urban and regional planning, both from the University of Minnesota. Chuck currently hosts the Strong Towns podcast and is a primary, a primary writer for Strong Towns web content. He has presented Strong Towns concepts in hundreds of cities and towns across North, North America, including Pensacola. He is featured in the documentary film on, film on a tale of two Americans and was named one of the 10 most influential urbanists of all time. In addition to being passionate about building a strong America, he loves playing music, is an obsessive reader and religiously follows his favorite team, the Minnesota Twins, that is a baseball team for some people who don't know that. Chuck and his wife live with their two daughters in their hometown of Brainerd, Minnesota. And at this time, I would like to introduce Chuck, who is our keynote speaker. And don't forget to make sure you put your, your, your chats down, your questions down in the chat box. Chuck, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Uh, I really appreciate it. And, and it's interesting because as you were uh, giving the invocation uh, across the street from my office is my church. And at noon every day, they ring the bells. And it's, uh, it was beautiful. So uh, simultaneous with you, uh, we got that here. So it was very uh, poetic. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we break out of a housing trap. And I, I want to take my time uh, to help you to, to the degree that we can, because uh, this is a difficult thing, understand the water that we're swimming in uh, and how it's affecting us from a housing standpoint and, and some of the things that we can do to, uh, to move out of that. Uh, our mission is to support a model of development that allows our cities, towns, and neighborhoods to become financially strong and resilient. It's great to be speaking to people uh, in Pensacola, particularly our 2019 strongest town uh, in the universe. So let me uh, explain what I mean by a housing trap. And I'm going to give an analogy with agriculture. If you go back in time, uh, human beings, uh, particularly, you know, in, in the age before agriculture, 
uh, lived lives that uh, were obviously meaningful, but, but full of difficulty. You spent most of your day trying to acquire food. Uh, it was difficult to do things like uh, art and music and science because literally like your entire day was spent uh, acquiring food. Uh, there have been studies of, of these types of civilizations because there are many people who still live this way today. And while there's a lot of beauty in it, uh, there's also a lot of struggle. Um, one of the ways that people dealt with this struggle was to eventually develop agriculture. And what they found with agriculture is that you could now uh, have more people doing other things. Uh, food uh, tending took a certain percent of your population, but now other parts of your population could become things like uh, priests or uh, warriors or scientists or what have you. Um, and so agriculture had an immediate benefit in that it made us more prosperous. The downside of agriculture is that once you can feed a lot of people, pretty soon you have a lot of people. The people who would normally die, not survive, uh, not in a sense your society not be fit enough, uh, all of a sudden those people could stick around. They could live longer. They'd have more prosperous lives. We look at this as a very positive thing, but the problem is, is that now you need to produce even more food because you have even more people. Of course, producing even more food uh, actually creates in your society even more people. And you see that in every step of this trap, you have the noblest of intentions. You have the most positive of outcomes. You have the thing that is very natural and human. We wanna help and serve and, and, and support our fellow humans. But every instance of doing that creates this obligation to do more and more and more lest we have some type of societal type of collapse. This in, in uh, sociological terms or in anthropological terms is called the agriculture trap. We see the same thing in housing. When we look at the New Deal, uh, we look at the Great Depression, what we see is that at, at the time of the Great Depression, almost all housing finance was local. And because it was local, it was done over short periods of time. You would get a mortgage or a, a loan. That loan would be a three-year, five-year, seven-year uh, with a big balloon on the end. And the reason is because local banks couldn't finance things long-term. They couldn't take that level of risk. And so they would hedge their risk with these shorter term loans. The problem is when we hit the Great Depression and housing prices started to drop precipitously, when those balloons would come due, the banks weren't going to loan you way more money than what your house was worth. And so all of a sudden now in a depression with high unemployment and stagnating wages and, and, and people in desperate economic straits, the banks would say, you need to come up with massive payments, that big balloon payment. Uh, otherwise, your house goes into foreclosure. Of course, the more houses that go into foreclosure, the lower prices go, and it became this downward deflationary spiral that we needed to somehow arrest. How do we do that? Well, we did that by stepping in and saying, hey, the federal government will insure that loan. Let's not make it a three-year, five-year, seven-year loan with all the volatility. Let's make it a 30-year mortgage. Let's spread those payments out over a longer period of time. Let's have lower uh, initial payments. Let's make the payments lower so that people can stay in their house and keep housing prices from, from declining in this deflationary spiral. Um, let's insure mortgages so that banks can feel more confident. And then let's create a secondary market so that uh, if we have qualifying mortgages, they can be sold off and the banks can actually get rid of that risk altogether. And so the federal government will take that risk. And so the idea was, let's keep more people in their homes. They can make the payments. They're, they're fine doing it. They're just by circumstance getting kicked out of their house. Let's arrest that. Let's stop that downward spiral. And, and let's allow more and more people to stay in their homes. It's hard to argue that this wasn't a necessary thing. It's hard to argue that this wasn't a good thing that actually helped us stabilize the economy. Um, you see decades later, uh, a competitor, Freddie Mac and other programs, and I'm gonna foreshadow a little bit here because what we found is that uh, the things that kept us out of a deflationary spiral in the 1930s, the thing that kept people in their homes, actually after the war became useful tools for growing our economy. Uh, as the war was ending, 
uh, World War II was ending, there was a huge concern amongst economists, amongst uh, thinkers at the time, that once we demobilized all these troops, once we uh, shut down all these factories that were building ships and munitions and airplanes and what have you, that we were just going to go right back into the 1930s. We were going to go right back into a deflationary downward spiral. Uh, of course, that's not what happened, right? What happened is that we took all of this capacity, all this capacity to build uh, you know, tanks and, and, and munitions and ships and, and, and this kind of population that was united against common enemies, uh, along with these tools that we had created to fight uh, economic decline. And we just put all those to work in building this new version of America. If uh, spreading out payments over a longer period of time, lowering down payments, if that helped people stay in their homes, it would also help people get into new homes. Uh, and so we just redirected our entire economy around this new system, this way of growing very, very quickly. And of course, we all are familiar with this story. We, we grew our cities incredibly fast in this post-World War II era. Um, this is the city of Fresno, California. Uh, I use Fresno because we've got great maps, but Fresno really mimics what we see in every city across the United States. Uh, here's the boundaries of Fresno in 1897. Here we go in 1909. You'll see this incremental kind of development pattern. Uh, now we're in the midst of the Great Depression and the end of World War II. Now look what happens. And we all kind of understand this story. Here's the decades after the war, this post-war expansion, when we had this, this new version of America uh, grow very, very quickly. Uh, what we see is that the expansion uh, of our country uh, horizontally out from our cities became very, very aggressive. And we were able to create a lot of housing in a very quick piece, uh, period of time. Um, if you look at something like my city, I live in Brainerd, Minnesota. It's a couple hours north of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, at the end of World War II, we were 13,500 people. Today, my city is 13,500 people. Uh, so no population growth, but we're 10 times the size. We're 10 times the area. Uh, this style of development allowed us to create growth very, very quickly, but of course it came with a lot of financial side effects, a lot of financial uh, dead weight, if we want to call it. This is data from Lafayette, Louisiana, which we're going to look at in a little bit more detail here in a minute. But at the end of World War II, Lafayette had a population of, of a little over 33,000. Today, it's a little over 120,000, a three and a half times increase. It's a huge amount of growth in that period of time. Uh, yet, if we look at how the people in, 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 in Lafayette get their water, at the end of World War II, it took five feet of pipe per person. Today, it takes 50 feet of pipe per person to provide clean water for the people of Lafayette. That's a 10 times increase. How about uh, their fire protection? At the end of World War II, it was 2.4 hydrants per thousand people. Today, it's 21 times that. And so you see that it takes more and more input to get the same amount of growth. Uh, it's taking an increase, in a sense, mathematical sense, we would call this diminishing returns. Uh, this would be fine, and we could justify this in many ways if our families were becoming richer, if we were being able to own uh, more home, uh, get more people into houses, we were experiencing broader prosperity. Uh, that's not what we're seeing in a city like Lafayette, which is very similar to cities all over North America. While we see the community liabilities grow, by 10 times and 20 times, what we see is that the median household income and family wealth is not growing anywhere near that amount. Uh, we can grow our macro economy very quickly, but at the local level, it's having all kinds of distorting effects. We have tried successively to uh, keep people in their homes, to make homes uh, more affordable to people, to basically go back to that uh, New Deal approach of how do we lower payments? How do we extend payments? How do we lower uh, down payments and get more people into homes by making them more affordable to finance? Uh, we've gone through successive uh, periods of this. Th these are interest rates over time, starting in 1982 until right after the 2008-2009 uh, the financial crises. Um, what you see is that as a population, we are saving less we are borrowing more. In a market economy, if you ha don't have enough savings and you have a lot of demand for borrowing, interest rates should go up. 
That's how you attract more savers and that's how you reduce borrowing. Uh, we've actually done the opposite. Uh, in order to get people into housing, in order to keep the housing component of our economy, which is a huge part of our economy going, we have artificially and successively lowered and lowered and lowered interest rates uh, to the point now where we have had over a decade of zero or near zero interest rates. Uh, this is the effect on housing prices. And if you look at, I, I chose this graph here because you can see the, the three little crises that are laid out here. Um, the US savings and loan, the dot-com bubble, the financial crises, uh, they're reflected in this map here as well as the 1970s boom, the 1980s boom, and then the, uh, the current boom. Uh, you see this correlation between interest rates and the boom and bust in the housing market. Uh, this is the Case-Shiller Index. For those of you that don't know the Case-Shiller Index, it's based on the novel insight that wages and housing prices are related. So as people make more money, they tend to pay more for housing. As they make less money, they pay less for housing. And so over time, as wages have gone up, housing prices have gone up. And so a ratio between the two stays pretty flat. Um, before the First World War, uh, you had them in kind of a range bound. There were a couple little bubbles here in the late 1800s around uh, railroad building. Uh, you know, after World War I, through the Great Depression, World War II, things stayed very low. Uh, in the post-war boom, you had a period of, of relative stability. Then you get the one little bubble, two little bubbles, and then, you know, the, the, the big bubble that we look back at in 2008 as, you know, the uh, big bubble where, um, you know, the Case-Shiller Index suggests that housing was double uh, what we could afford based on our wages. And again, this is not poor people. Uh, this is median wages throughout the country. So, we can talk about the effect on the very poor and the very disadvantaged. Uh, it is this magnified many times over. What we're seeing here is that even people who we would consider middle class or consider in, in the median of the country uh, are finding housing prices incredibly unaffordable. Um, I want to point out what's happened since that period of time. Uh, this is the Case-Shiller Index zoomed in from the 80s uh, it's funny because when you look at it in this way, the, the bubble here is very small. Uh, you know, back here, it's a, it's a noticeable boom right here, but in this one, it's small. But here's our big run-up in the, uh, the 2000 to 2008 period. Um, we call this a housing bubble. Uh, when I ask crowds, you know, what would you call this? Everybody says housing bubble. That's what we've constructed a narrative around that. Uh, yet when we look at what has happened since that period of time, uh, you know, we call this a bubble, but we call this a recovery. Um, you know, no one uh, blows a financial bubble and then, you know, kind of primes off of that peak and says, well, that's the new normal now. Uh, the way that finance works is that if something is a bubble and then the bubble deflates, uh, you go back to, you know, quote unquote, normal. Uh, that's not what we did. We had a little bit of a deflationary episode, and then we blew that bubble right back up. Um, we are now at epic proportions of unaffordability nationwide in terms of housing, uh, and have created a very tenuous situation for ourselves that we can see in the, in the post-COVID world uh, remains tenuous. Um, you know, we have, in a sense, pegged our housing markets on maximum price appreciation. And people who are buying into it today, even at the median and the above median levels, so people that we would generally as a society think of as middle class or upper middle class, are buying an overappreciated asset uh, on the basis that that asset will continue to appreciate at rates uh, beyond any historical norm. Um, of course, uh, we have, uh, as part of this process, uh, in a sense, nationalized home building. Uh, Habitat for Humanity is one of the few remaining players uh, at the local level who works at a small scale. Uh, what we see is that most of our housing is now delivered by large firms uh, backed by Wall Street finance. Uh, a, a, lot, I was, a, a lot of the, uh, the home buying, even, of existing homes is now being done uh, by Wall Street money, by liquidity pumped into the market. Uh, I was in the little town of Salida, Oklahoma, uh, uh, Colorado, 
uh, before the pandemic started. And uh, their big issue was housing affordability. And it was fascinating because the marginal buyer, and this is a place that took, you know, I flew somewhere remote, uh, took three flights to get there, uh, drove an hour to get to this little town. So it's not like this is a very accessible place. Very beautiful, yes, but not very accessible. Um, the marginal buyer there, the buyer who was buying up 5% of the properties and, and, and driving the prices up to levels that were absurd for the local economy uh, was all driven by Wall Street money. It was all people coming in and looking to park money somewhere and real estate in that sense looked like a better investment than anything else they could get into. It's important to note that with all of this effort into pumping up housing prices and making housing prices uh, you know, go up as, as a way to keep our economy going, uh, that we do have this kind of structural problem now that we have created. Uh, you know, we have to keep this bubble up Otherwise our economy implodes, yet the mechanisms for keeping it there are not clear. This is a population pyramid. So you're looking at the left of, of males and the right females as a percentage of the po millions of people in the population. Uh, you can see this, this big group right here that I've highlighted. Uh, those are the millennials. Um, uh, this group here is the baby boomers. Uh, I live in that little range of forgotten people in between. Uh, but nonetheless, it's these two groups that are driving the economics of our country. Um, the interesting thing about housing is that that top group uh, needs to sell their housing at artificially high prices to the people in the bottom group. Uh, who are those people in the bottom group? Uh, what is their life like? Uh, they are broke. They have high college debt. They have low savings rates. Uh, they have had delayed careers because as soon as they got out of college, they had to deal with the 2008 crisis. They've never really had a real recovery from that. Now they're dealing with a pandemic and a second economic crisis. Uh, they're overeducated in the sense that they are competing for fewer and fewer high paying jobs with more and more people. Uh, and so you have this uh, breakdown uh, where the handoff uh, from, you know, the upper group to the bottom group is not very clear. Uh, and that would be, you know, uh, optimistic if the bottom group actually wanted the housing that the top group has. Uh, there's a real uh, gap in terms of the desire of that bottom group to live in the housing owned by the top group. And so we have, you know, this kind of structural problem that is, I think, grinding this thing to a, to a head. This all leads me to this slide here, which I, I, I shared this once a, a couple of years ago and, and people stood up and took photos of it, which is how you know you've got a good slide. Uh, this just notion of who benefits from high housing prices, because when we listen to people, we all talk about, we would like housing to be affordable. We would like prices to be accessible to people. We'd like to get people into houses. But what that typically means is that we would like to create ways for people to take on debt, ways for people to finance housing, ways for uh, us to, you know, tax people or rent control uh, developers or gouge someone else, because really, we don't want housing prices to go down. If you're a local government, and a huge amount of your uh, tax receipts is based on property tax, the last thing you want is for housing prices to go down. If you're the state and federal government and the whole housing market is how you're financing, you know, 20, 25% of your uh, revenue, you do not want prices to go down. If you own a home or you are a bank who has a mortgage on a home or an insurance company, you, you do not want housing prices to go down. If you're a developer, contractor, land speculator, Rising housing prices has bailed you out so many times when you've done a bad deal or had something go wrong. You just wait a little bit and the appreciation kind of solves your problem for you. You do not want housing prices to go down. If you are running a pension fund, the last thing you want is for housing in America to go back to a market price, to go back to a price that people could afford. So there is, a, you know, a desire that we all have to have housing be affordable for people. Uh, but that desire conflicts with this, this essential need we have to have housing prices stay stable 
or preferably to continue to rise. Who doesn't benefit from this? People who don't own homes, uh, people who rent, uh, the poor, the disadvantaged, uh, the people you know on the on the one side of the seesaw there. Uh, this is, I think, the difficulty we have because I think we can all have very good intentions here, but when the options on the table are all options that have to continue the current high level of housing prices uh, in order for our systems to work, uh, it actually takes 90 plus percent of the options off the table and leaves us with very few. What this has had the effect of doing, and I'm gonna give you a Minnesota analogy here, uh, so I realize in Pensacola, you don't have to deal with uh, snow. Sometimes I, I think you've had black ice, maybe a time or two. The idea when you're driving on snow is that you want to not overcorrect. Um, because what happens is you, you do a little bit of a correction. Your car will start to slide a little bit. If you then overcorrect, you're done because the car will start to swerve. You overcorrect, it swerves more. You overcorrect, it swerves more. And pretty soon it's spinning out of control. Housing in our country uh, when you look back at the history, we tried to correct. And that correction created a system where we overcorrected the other way and we overcorrected the other way. And now we're sitting here with this crazy spinning around and around where we have interest rates at zero. You can get a home mortgage, uh, you know, with a very low down payment, uh, with payments insured by the federal government, with the Federal Reserve buying up those mortgages so the banks take on very low interest rates. Uh, you know, you can get that at 3% or sub 3% I saw the other day. Uh, we have created, we have used all the tools that we have to get more and more people into elevated housing prices. And uh, that game is not working. That system feels very much like it is broke and it is about to fall apart. What I want to help you do beyond recognizing that is break out of that system. Um, we are not going to, in Pensacola, we are not going to, in Brainerd, uh, change the housing market. Uh, the housing market is, is federalized. It's going to be given to us. It's going to be bequeathed to us and passed down. What we can do is carve out a healthy niche and put ourselves in a position to survive whatever kind of transition is coming. Housing, at the end of the day, should be and, and, and has historically been until we made it the center of our growth strategy. Uh, you know, over the last 70 years, 80 years, housing has been part of a complex adaptive system. When I say complex adaptive system, I want you to think of like a rainforest. We understand that a rainforest is made up of many different types of flora and fauna. They all uh, interact in complex ways. When we look at a rainforest, we realize it's not ordered, that the order of the rainforest is emergent. It emerges from all these complex adaptations. This is the way that housing has traditionally worked. Housing has been part of a complex adaptive system. It's not just finance. It's not just your ability to afford. It's part of a broader culture. It's part of a broader environment. Uh, there are so many things that affect where people build, when they build, what they build. Uh, these are complex adaptive systems. If you think of a complex adaptive system, it's different than a system that is merely complicated. Complicated systems, like a, like a, like, like a machine, a Rube Goldberg machine, uh, you know, a Rube Goldberg machine, the novelty of it is that it's complicated. There's a lot of things going on. But if you cut one of these ropes or move one of these blocks, the Rube Goldberg machine doesn't uh, adapt. It doesn't uh, evolve and change. It doesn't meet new conditions. It just breaks. It just stops working. If you think of your automobile engine, it's a very complicated machine. But if you stress it too much, if you put it through too much stress, it doesn't evolve and adapt and change to new circumstances. It doesn't become a toaster or a wash machine, it just stops being a car engine, it just breaks. This is the difference between systems that are complex and systems that are merely complicated. Complex systems adapt and evolve. If a rainforest gets a lot of rain or a lot of sun, it doesn't fail, it doesn't stop, it, it adapts and changes. When you look at a cornfield, which is a system that is merely complicated, give it too much rain, give it too much sun, and it, it doesn't evolve and become soybeans, it doesn't adapt and become potatoes, it, it just becomes bad corn, it just stops working. Uh, the same thing goes with housing. Uh, when we build uh, complex systems that are adaptive, that respond to people and people's needs, the ability to afford a house, the ability to maintain a house, 
what we see is that these systems develop a complex adaptive emergent nature. When we build the same thing over and over and over, when we have the same financing system, when we have the same building system, when we have the same exact approach, what we see is that, yes, we can build very efficiently, we can build a lot, uh, but when things stop working, we lack the ability to evolve and adapt and see new systems emerge. What we need at the local level is to start nudging our systems back, start moving our systems back into being complex. This is the way cities have always been built. This is my hometown, Brainerd, Minnesota, back in 1870. This is the very first iteration. And if we went back to Pensacola, there's a very first iteration of Pensacola as well. And it looked very much like this, just a series of little pop-up shacks. These were some hopes and some dreams about the future. Understand the dynamics of a place like this. You would have people who basically were speculating. They would come up to the middle of nowhere. They would go to Pensacola before it was a place and they would build some little pop-up shacks like this. And they would hope that if enough people move there, it would become more of a place. And when it became more of a place, the actual land would start to increase in value. And that increase in value of the land combined with the declining value of these little pop-up shacks would create a redevelopment scenario where now you could justify building a bigger, a more expensive, a more valuable place. And if you look 30 years later, that's exactly what happened. This is the same exact street as the pop-up shacks, but it's 30 years later. As more and more people moved here, the land becomes more valuable. The buildings are built uh, cheaply at first, a little bit better at second. Uh, but then over time, as the land value goes up and the buildings become worth less in relation to the land, uh, you see even more redevelopment. This is the same street 40 years later. Those wood buildings are now replaced by buildings of brick and granite, substantial structures that will last century or more. This is the style of development we see in cities all over the world. This is a complex adaptive system where cities uh, are not built all at once to a finished state, the way we build them today, kind of locked in stasis, but they're built and designed with an understanding that they will evolve and adapt to meet the changing economics and the changing needs of the people that are there. Um, in case you're wondering, this is what the street looks like today. As we ran the highway through the middle of town, we knocked out those property values, the, the underlying land values. Without the rising land values, basically with land values everywhere kind of uh, equilibrate at, at a lower level, uh, what we did is we killed that redevelopment cycle. And you can see you know, a street like this has lost its buildings. Uh, it's become a, a collection of, of vacant properties and, uh, and, uh, and parking lots. Um, this is the kind of devaluation we see with the current kind of build it and they will come style of development. If you take a look at these two lots, uh, you'll see on the left that traditional style, these were built in the 1920s, uh, the little pop-up shack on the edge of town. Uh, you had hoped at the time that, you know, things would continue to improve. You would eventually get second and third stories. Um, that's not what happened. We ran the highway. That's the highway just uh, right along here through the middle of the city, uh, kind of drove away that complex adaptive nature, became uh, all about the complicated, uh, not the complex. So remove the adaptation. And uh, 70 years later, the city uh, has seen no change in this block. Uh, the block on the right used to look just like it. We got it torn down and now redeveloped with something new. Uh, it took you know, almost three decades of tax subsidy guarantees to make this transition happen. That would be sad enough, uh, but what we see is that even without the tax subsidy, uh, we have a massive devaluation of the property. The property on the left, these old blighted rundown, uh, you know, nasty looking buildings that uh, the city has labeled as blight, uh, actually have more value, more wealth, more opportunity for the community than the one on the right. Um, this is a theme that I want to double down on because what we see today, and this is a map of Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, what you're looking at here is the profit and loss of each parcel within the city. Um, every place where you see a blue property, that property pays more in taxes and fees on an annual basis to the city than it costs to provide service and maintenance. Everywhere where you see red is the exact opposite. These places cost more to service and maintain than they provide in wealth to the community. Um, what we see today is that our most profitable neighborhoods uh, are also generally correlated with our poorest neighborhoods. The blue neighborhoods in this map are the ones on the right here. 
Uh, the red neighborhoods, of course, look like these ones on the left. Uh, the built all at once to a finished state uh, type of places. Uh, on the right, you have the traditional pattern of development. You have these old places uh, that are designed to evolve, designed to adapt. And even in their rundown dilapidated state, even in their neglected condition, they still financially outperform the stuff that we're building brand new today. The stuff on the left is growth. It creates jobs, it creates immediate tax benefits, uh, it creates cash, uh, but it also creates these enormous long-term liabilities. You saw that in the Lafayette uh, data I showed you earlier where uh, now it takes 10 times uh, you know, the amount of pipe to provide water service, 25 times the amount, or 21 times the amount of hydrants. Uh, the stuff on the left is very expensive to service and maintain and over time uh, is a financial noose around the community's neck. If we're gonna start complex adaptive uh, reuse, it's gonna start in places that look like the right, uh, that stuff on the right. How do we do that in a way that is respectful, that brings people along with us, that keeps people in their homes and that builds wealth in those neighborhoods? Uh, I'm gonna give you a, a few steps. These are kind of uh, universal ideas that we've developed at Strong Towns. The first one is uh, we have to allow everywhere at, at all times, the next increment of intensity by right. Uh, the idea that you can go from a small shack to a large house to a, a, a more finished street, um, those steps need to be allowed by right. And by, by right, what I mean is that you should be able to walk into City Hall at, at 9 a.m. with a completed permit application and then walk out by noon with a permit. You shouldn't have to go to public hearings. You shouldn't have to beg your neighbors. If you have a single family home, you should be able to turn it into a duplex without you know, any real regulatory friction in making that happen. As a, as a, as a corollary or as a, as a statement that goes along with that, uh, we always share this insight from Strong Towns. No neighborhood should experience radical change, but no neighborhood can be exempt from change. What we have often come to uh, as a solution to affordability uh, is, is stuff like this, you know, the idea that uh, what we will do to make houses affordable is we'll deliver them at scale on mass. And, and this is essentially taking our current financing system, which likes to work in large increments, which likes to work with lots of liquidity, which is financed, you know, through these large corporations from central places and saying, you know, we can deliver this on mass. Let's do that. And what we see is that as a, as a, as a compromise in our community, we will say, all right, 90% of our neighborhoods or 95% of our neighborhoods, don't worry about it. You're not gonna experience any change at all. But 5% of our neighborhoods are gonna be completely unrecognizable tomorrow. It's gonna to change overnight. And this has created not only a lot of social tension, but a lot of financial and economic uh, tension. Um, I wanna walk you through a little scenario here. Let's say you own this vacant lot between these two buildings. On the left, you've got a single family home. On the right, you've got a condo building. How much do you sell your single, your vacant lot for? Your lot's for sale, you're gonna sell it. How much do you sell it? Well, you look at the single family home on the left and you see it's worth $200,000. You look at the condo building on the right, you see it's worth $10 million. How do you value that vacant lot? Well, you would understand that, you know, the land portion of that single family home is about 30,000. The land portion of that condo unit is about 1.5 million. And so you ask yourself, uh, do I foresee a single family home being built on my vacant lot or do I foresee a condo unit? Uh, would I rather have 30,000 or 1.5 million? Well, I, I think the answer to that is pretty obvious. I'd rather it be a condo unit. And so the value of that lot becomes 1.5 million. That's what I put it up for sale because I know that a developer can come in and the highest and best use will drive that. Okay, that's fine. That's the market as we've created it, right? What's that single family home worth now? It's not worth 200,000 anymore. It's worth something else. And not only is it worth something else, but it's not worth anything to improve. If the roof starts to go bad, if the renter in there is complaining about the plumbing, why would I go in and fix any of that? All the values now in the land and it's artificially in the land. It's not really in the land, it's artificially in the land. And it's artificially in the land because of the way we've chosen to develop, because we've developed in large leaps. This is an unhealthy way for our communities to grow. And so when we say no uh, neighborhood should experience uh, you know, radical change, 
no neighborhood should be exempt from change. What we're suggesting is that we need to recreate that organic growth, that feedback loop, the complex adaptive system that allows our neighborhoods to start to respond to the people who are there. We need to lower the bar of entry. We need to make it easier, not for people to finance homes and get into longer mortgages and basically, you know, take on more and more commitment. We actually need to make it easier for people to build a house. This is something in my community we call a tiny home. My ancestors would have called this a home. Uh, we've added the word tiny for some reason, and I really don't know why, because what this really is is a starter home. I can go around the neighborhoods in my community and I can find uh, houses that began as 400, 500, 600 square foot homes. These are not easy to finance today. There's not really a, 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 you know, a market for them on the secondary market. You're not going to get DR Horton come in and build a bunch of these. Yet this is the exact type of home that everybody used to start with 100 years ago. You would build a small little house. You would get, borrow a little bit of money maybe, but not much. When you had a kid, you would put an addition on the back. When you got a raise at work, you would put it on the second story. You can go around to your older neighborhoods and see the evolution of these places. We can get more people into homes by lowering the bar of entry. We also have to change the way we uh, invest in these neighborhoods. The neighborhoods that are struggling, the neighborhoods that we want to see come back, the neighborhoods that have uh, the highest potential for these complex adaptive feedback loops. We actually need to shift our public investment strategy from being top down to being very bottom up. We need to actually go out uh, and respond to how people are using the city. If we want complex adaptive feedback, we have to be providing that ourselves. At Strong Towns, we have uh, created a four step approach to making these types of public investments. Uh, step number one, uh, go out and humbly observe where people in the community struggle. Uh, go out and uh, with humility, uh, observe, uh, walk with people, uh, talk to them, uh, experience the city as they are experiencing it, and try to understand from their perspective where they are struggling with it today. Step number two, ask the question, what is the next smallest thing we can do right now to address that struggle. Uh, not what is the big ultimate solution, not how do we solve this for all time, but what is the thing we can do with straw bales and duct tape and paint and cones to, to help make this a little bit better right now. Step three, go do that thing. Uh, do it immediately. Don't hire a consultant. Don't debate it for six months. It's just a small little thing. Go out and do it. And then the fourth step is to repeat. Repeat this process over and over and over and over. Um, Jane Jacobs called uh, cities uh, co-creations, things we build together. And in this uh, post, you know, New Deal, post World War II era, cities have increasingly become something that we pay for, something that we just sign up for, we pay our mortgage, we pay our rent, uh, we pay our taxes, and we expect someone to deliver for us. This is not how complex adaptive systems work. This is not how successful systems work. And we can see more and more people getting priced out of that approach. We need to get back to our cities as co-creations, as things we build together. And we start th that process by identifying where people struggle. We can continue on this path, uh, this kind of top-down path where we try to solve every problem with a big program, uh, a big initiative, uh, a big spending here or a, a debt financing thing here. This is Lawton, Oklahoma, a city I spent some time in. I, I, I like the people here. It made me sad that they got a big, you know, $20 million Tiger Grant program to come in and put decorative streetlights and decorative sidewalks and all this stuff. When really you can look here and what the problem is, is they don't have a place. They actually start building a place instead of trying to impose one. Um, we can continue on this path and not really respond to the struggles and the needs of people. Uh, or we can humble ourselves to ask a different set of questions. How do we make this stuff more accessible? How do we actually lower the bar of entry? How do we create feedback loops that will equilibrate prices and, and, and markets to what people can actually afford to pay? Uh, you see examples of this in places like Memphis, Tennessee. It's a little broad avenue project where they went out and, and humbled themselves to observe where people struggled. 
uh, took little steps to make it better and have seen huge, huge results, uh, you know, huge, huge uh, returns as a result. Um, I'm going to pause and, and take some questions, uh, but I want to just lean into this, this overarching theme here that uh, the, the, the systems that we are working in were set up to solve a very specific problem in the 1930s. It's a problem that needed to be solved and needed to be addressed. Um, but the, the, the atrophy or the magnification of that system over decades and decades and decades and decades uh, has become a monster. It's become a thing unto itself. And if we want to start to create some sensibility in our housing approach, if we want to create a, a market that actually responds to the people in our communities and their needs, um, we're going to have to be proactive and, and step up and, and do that ourselves. So uh, Al, uh, Marcy, I'm not sure who uh, is going to point us to the right questions, but I'm, I'm happy to hang out and take some here and do what I can. Yes, sir. Well, thank you for that presentation. I mean, you know, you walk us down memory lane and then add some very comparative things that we can look at and identify what systems were put in place and how we move from complex adaptive systems to a complex, complex more, um, more, more system that does, is not compatible with what we need for today. So what I do have here are some questions that are up and I want to read them for you. What do you believe to be the greatest barrier to achieving social equity and affordability in housing? Um, I think right now it's that everybody has to play by the, the rules of the, uh, uh, essentially the Wall Street, Washington, D.C. rules. So um, if, if you look right now, uh, success is how do we get you into a 30-year mortgage? Um, you're close enough to New Orleans, uh, where I, I think this example will, will be personal to some people. If you look at New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, one of the things that they found is that they could go in and give people double what their properties were worth. You go in and say, okay, your house is condemned. Uh, you know, it was only worth 80,000. We'll give you 150,000. Um, but you couldn't rebuild a house for 150,000. It was going to cost you 250 or 300,000. And so what happened is that the people who had incrementally built that city and who owned a house that was 80,000 and had inherited from family and, and you know, didn't have to work a 40 hour a week, nine to five corporate job because they didn't have a mortgage. They didn't have, they, they, did, they, they, they lived a lifestyle that was not that lifestyle, basically got that taken away from them. And, and the result was, no, you're going to enter the system now. You're going to have to get a mortgage. You're going to have to get a full-time job. You're going to have to live uh, a, a different life. You're going to have to become basically a, uh, you know, a part of this, this finance machine. Um, and a lot of them, you know, it, it, it totally transformed New Orleans in ways that they're still struggling to recover from. So I think it's the fact that we have said everyone must play by these rules. Uh, you know, it, you're going to either be part of an ownership society where you're going to have a 30 year mortgage and you're going to make payments on that, or you don't get to play the game. And I, I, I think that that has historic, no real historic basis and is brutally unfair to lots and lots of people who that's not their, that's not their lifestyle. And that's not the way they're ever going to, that's not the way they're going to function in society. Well, thank you much for that answer, sir. I want to encourage everyone to make sure you put your questions in the chat box and I'll try to get to them as, as quickly as possible. I have another one here. How would you, how would you equate walkability or bikeability to neighborhoods that may be, or may be more or less suited for evolution or growth? It's a really good question. Um, I, I, I'm going to take it in two different directions. Uh, Direction number one is when you look at neighborhoods that hold their value and also have the most explosive increases in cost, they tend to be neighborhoods that are walkable. Um, and so when we talk about things like gentrification and, you know, coming into a neighborhood and transforming it, when I showed you those large investments where you're taking dilapidated houses and putting the condo unit next to them, 
they, people who are doing that tend to look for neighborhoods that are walkable uh, because that's where those types of investments um, are easiest to make and have the broadest market penetration. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of neighborhoods that uh, are on the borderline of being walkable or are walkable um, where small improvements in them or small changes in them, fixing a crosswalk here, adding some trees over there, uh, patching up some broken sidewalks, would have real noticeable gains in quality of life for the people who live there. And the reality is that if you live in a neighborhood where you can have one car instead of two, what you've done is you've, by, by, by having that family only have the burden of one car instead of two cars, you've given them another seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a year that they can spend on savings, spend on their improving their house, spend on, you know, their security and stability. If you require them in order to, as an anti, participate in your society, you have to own two cars. Uh, now all of a sudden you put a tremendous financial burden on them. So to me, the low hanging fruit for uh, liberating families and, and, and allowing people of modest and, and, and limited means full access to society is to create neighborhoods that are intrinsically walkable and allow them the opportunity to own a car or not, to bike somewhere or not, to walk somewhere or not, give them options. And if you give them options, uh, now they can make multiple choices and that's, when I say complex adaptive system, what I'm talking about is give people multiple choices and they will adapt and change based on their circumstances. Thank you, sir, for that. Just want to remind attendees to put those questions in the Q&A. We got a ton of questions coming through. I want, want to ask a few more. I got one here that talks about what are some examples of short-term solutions that have had successful in other cities that were successful in other cities that may be able to be uh, easily trans translated to solutions to full country code. It, uh, there's two parts of that question that that my brain hangs up with, and I think if we were all in person talking for a long time, we could we could work through this. The the first one is a short term. Um, I, I I don't I don't know. The the other one is solutions. <laughs> so let me let me deal with those together. I, I think when we think of things as complicated uh, and, and not complex, what you're thinking of is I have the problem in front of me, how do I solve it? And then there's another problem and how do I solve it? And those tend to be short-term solutions. I want you to think of housing as a complex adaptive system. And in a complex adaptive system, there really aren't problems or solutions because nothing's ever solved. What there is, is ongoing evolution and change. There's adaptation. What we really want is we want our housing markets to respond to the people who are there. So if people are making less money, you actually want housing prices to come down. If people are making more money, housing prices can go up. You want them to respond to a local market. If there's not enough single family housing, let's build more of that. If there's not enough accessory apartments, let's build more of that. And so, I want our thinking to evolve beyond, uh, you know, problem solution because there are no solutions and more into how do we make this thing more responsive to us as a community, as opposed to responsive to outside forces and outside markets. That being said, a, a couple of the quickest things that I, I think you can do to start that process, uh, go towards accessory apartments, accessory dwelling units, um, basically allowing people to convert their garages into a house, convert their basement into a duplex unit, B basically allow people more flexibility to take the next step in building wealth and value in their house. Um, this allows people to stay in their homes. Uh, the, the, the kind of quintessential case, there's many ways of thinking of this, but think of the, uh, the widow who now doesn't have the income to maintain the house. And so that person can either lose the house to the bank, sell the house and move, 
or maybe they can take the spare room that they're not using anymore or the other, you know, the lower level that they're not using anymore and convert that into a duplex and rent it out and now use that rental income to stay in the house and maintain it. That was an option that was available for people for thousands of years that we have taken away through zoning, through, uh, you know, uh, building controls that we can just give back to people and give them those options to build their own wealth and create their own stability and security. Thank you, sir, for that. Got a couple more questions if we have time here. One talks about the infrastructure and disinvestment and it says, how often does infrastructure disinvestment or neglect play a role in a neighborhood? Um, I, I, I feel like it, it follows, I feel like it follows a natural cycle, right? Um, we, today, the way we build is we build things all at once and we build it to a finished state. So think of your residential subdivision that was built in the, in the early 2000s. If you go out there today, that thing is now 15, 20 years old. Uh, you can start to see a little bit of wear and aging, but it's probably the nicer neighborhood. It's got nicer sidewalks, nicer streets, nicer pipe. It's all maintained. It's all brand new. Now go to the place that was built in the 1970s or 1980s. And what you see is that that's gone through an iteration. When you build 100 homes at the same time in the same subdivision, uh, 30 years later, everybody's roof goes bad at the same time. Everybody's sidewalk falls apart at the same time in the whole neighborhood. Everybody's refrigerator goes bad at the same time in the whole neighborhood. So all at once, this neighborhood experiences decline simultaneously. And, uh, you know, you're not giving any means to arrest that decline. You can't take your single family home, convert it into a duplex, use that cash flow to fix things up. You're either going to maintain it or not. And so what happens is that the affluent people in that declining neighborhood move to the new neighborhood. And what you see is that neighborhoods get stuck in a cycle of decline. And it really has uh, to do with their age. It's not really government policy. Government policy kind of reflects it because the neighborhoods that are new with the new developers and the wealthier people can get the attention. The older neighborhoods where people are more disenfranchised and where there isn't that wealth uh, tend to you know, fall to the side because there isn't anyone really advocating for them. And so it becomes like a self-reinforcing cycle that's built into the system from the start because of how we built them, designed them, as complicated machines, not as complex adaptive systems. Thank you, sir. It looks like we have time for perhaps one more question I want to throw out there. Uh, what approaches will be needed for the Alice population that are not benefited from the high home costs to those, to those in, the, in this environment? Al, say, that, say that again. I, I'm, I'm okay. not following that one completely. Yeah, I was trying to read. What approaches would be needed for the Alice population that are not benefiting from the high home costs to thrive in this environment? So you're talking about low-income families. Yeah. And how, how do they benefit? I, I think earlier you kind of touched a little bit on it about giving them the opportunity to, to, to adapt. Uh, so maybe perhaps along those lines. I, 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 think, I think that there has to be a, a recognition of two things. The, the first is that our current system is not designed for them. And so if we try to, and, and this, is, this is not a knock on Habitat because what I admire most about Habitat for Humanity is that you've taken a system that I think is really difficult to work in, in terms of providing homes for people of, of limited means. You have taken that system and you've done miracles with it. Um, and it's, it's a really difficult, difficult job to do. Um, if we want to do that at scale, if we want to do that with more and more people, I, I mean, I think organizations like Habitat, uh, you know, short-term programs, uh, I've seen rent control programs and other programs that I think over the long term are really destructive, but as a short-term response, as kind of like a, a transition response, can maybe help alleviate some of the some of the peaks and some of the, 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 the most difficult parts of this. But ultimately what we need to do is we need to almost protect those neighborhoods uh, from the large distortions, the large changes that price people out 
and then allow more flexibility within those neighborhoods for people to get started in smaller homes, to get started in accessory units, to, to convert their houses into multiple units so that they can rent one out or sell one separately. We basically need to give people more options to start small and allow them to build their own wealth. The, 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 when I say lower the bar to entry, some people sometimes interpret that as a bad thing. I, I don't. If you're saying the bar to entry is you must be able to qualify for a 30-year mortgage, and that means you must have a credit score of 720 or above. That means you must have a 40-hour week job, and I've had that for the last two years. That means you must, you know, have a credit card history that's positive. You've got all these barriers. Like that's the that's what you got to do to play the game. What I'm saying is that there's a whole lot of people who can't play that game, who are really good citizens, who have a lot to contribute, who want to be part of this system. And so we need to have a place where they can enter the game, enter the system that we have and, and fully participate without meeting that barrier. And, and the more we can do that, I think the more opportunity we're gonna to provide to everybody. Well, sir, thank you for that response. I, I we definitely thank you for taking the time out to, to come and participate in our summit here today. I, I know that you have an, 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 a prior engagement that you have to get to. But, uh, <laughs> I <laughs> do. Thank you. <laughs> so if it's there very, any other, go ahead. I just want to say thank you. And I, I do admire the work you're doing. And, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and be part of this conversation. And I really do hope to get to Pensacola again very soon because it's one of my favorite places. So thank you. Well, sir, you are always welcome. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank, thank all the other panelists for being here. Thanks for the viewers who are online watching us and, and stayed in and tuned in to what we're doing right now. So we want to move right on. I want to make sure that you post those, those questions in the Q&A session, or I'm sorry, in the chat function so we can also always get those things answered for you. There will also be an opportunity for us to record this. We'll record it live and we will, if you send us a, a, a message, a info at PensacolaHabitat.org, we'll make sure you get a link for the video. Next up, I would like to introduce Paige Richards. She's our next guest. She is the Vice President of Operations for 90 Works. She has been with the organization for eight years and currently oversees supportive services for homeless families. The family support team, and other housing programs. Paige is a Pensacola native and her passion is to serve the community she has loved for so long. While studying social work at the University of West Florida, Paige served as the president of the Student Social, Student social Work Association during this time. With her peers and professors, they held trips to Tallahassee meeting with representatives from Circuit One on social justice initiatives. Before, before her promotion in 2020, they served as the program manager of the family support team, working with families at high risk of child abuse and neglect. She enjoys working at both the micro and macro level of social work. Driven by the 90 Works mission, Paige is committed to advancing the 90 Works case management model, Project 90, to help people move out of poverty. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Paige, who will be talking to us about transitioning out of homeless. Paige, you're on. Hello, thanks for having me. I'm a, I'm a bit of a late substitute for someone else uh, last week, so my slideshow is going to be a lot shorter um, today. So again, I'm really thankful to be here and be amongst people in our community that are, that are serving uh, this population. So I'm going to do what Crystal showed me how to do, and I'm going to share my screen real quick. Okay, so this is, like they said, I'm Vice President of Operations in Florida and uh, I speak on behalf of what we're doing here at 90 Works to help people transition out of homelessness. So our slideshow is going to kind of keep me on track and make sure we're on time today. So the first question I had when they asked me to fill this spot was, what is transitioning out of homelessness? So it's not gonna be a poll that comes up, but if you have a piece of paper, just jot down really quickly, like, 
what do you think that is? What, what, what does transitioning out of homelessness really mean? It's a system word that we use and utilize often, but what does that look like to you? So I'm, I'm going to be curious and to see what you guys have to say, and we'll, we'll look back at it in a little bit. So while we're doing that, um, I think it really goes well with what uh, Charles was presenting just a second ago is it's very clear um, transitioning out of homelessness isn't just uh, a burden of the person who is experiencing instability in their in housing, rather a community problem that we need to face together. So I think that's important when we're viewing transitioning out of homelessness. I'm just gonna start with the best way I know how. I asked a peer of mine how she would talk about transitioning out of homelessness and she said, well, share a success story or share one of your stories. So that's what I'm gonna do today. Hopefully it will be a meaningful time for you all. I started at 90 Works. It was actually called Families Count at the time and I was working with a mom who was dealing with chronic homelessness and had been couch surfing pretty much her entire adult life. I walk into the room, so I'm just gonna kind of give you the backdrop. I walk in, I'm, I'm very young, very new at this journey, and I walk in and I have my nurturing parenting book because that's what I'm supposed to do is help her with parenting. And I walk out um, and she gives me three bills. And she's like, no, 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 we can't talk about that today. I'm gonna give you these three, these three bills. It was her, it was, a how, uh, it was a power bill and some other variations along there. And so I bring them back to my supervisor and they're like, yeah, we can help. Well, by the time I get to my next appointment, just a few days later with her, um, she's been evicted. And that wasn't one of the bills she gave me. And her, unfortunately, she had lost everything. They, when they locked her out, we had no beds for kids. We had nothing. And so I'm feeling pretty... Um, I just didn't feel like I could help because here I am with my little parenting book, gonna teach her about positive and negative feelings when we're dealing with nowhere to sleep, no food, no transportation, nothing. So it was pretty much divine timing if you ask me. 90, uh, 90 Works made the transition from Families Count to 90 Works and so around our model and so we started implementing that. So I was literally trained on our Project 90 model during my uh, case management with, the, with this customer. And we were sitting there together. This mom didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. How was I gonna help her get out of this cycle? She was um, defeated. The Department of Children and Families were um, closing in. She had already lost children. Um, her rights have been terminated to older children. And she was like, I don't want that to happen again. And she looked at me and just said, help me. And so thankfully we started implementing these other things. Um, and we began on a journey for the both of us. Our mission at 90 Works became uh, overcoming and preventing homelessness, poverty, and family violence by becoming self-sufficient. We focus on six areas of self-sufficiency and you can see those on the slideshow housing income transportation health safety and support and so we basically I go to her and I say what's really going on here why can't we keep you housed you're you're smart you're bright you always end up back doing it on your own so why can't we keep you there what's what's the the deficit what are we missing here so we uh and I can remember the next part so clearly, and I'm sure that you um, all have a memory like this too. I'm sitting on her, we find, she found a month to month lease. We're sitting on her floor, because again, we've lost it. She's lost everything. We have nothing to start with. And it was like this old blue shaggy carpet and we're sitting on it. And uh, she's like, I, I want this to be my home. I don't want to move again. I, this, is, this is very important to me. And so we made a pact right there on that blue floor that we were gonna keep her there and we were going to um, help identify what was going on and why she couldn't stay housed. She was very uh, used to the system. She had been helped by many programs before, but we, she just couldn't overcome. 
So we took a bit of a different approach. We started looking at her housing and obviously we knew that her housing was was poor so we it was vulnerable at the time she was in crisis she did not have a way to pay the next month's bills and what were we going to do so luckily with um our program we do have temporary financial assistance so with the tfa we were able to put a couple months in that way we had some time to work on these other things and get to the root of the problem we go through income because well obviously you need income to continue to pay well she doesn't really um, have a long job history. We don't, you know, what's going, most of it has been under the table. And I said, well, why? Why haven't you had another job? And kind of came up that she didn't have the proper identification to proceed with an application. So we wrote that as a barrier on the case plan and we moved on to transportation. Well, at transportation, she had someone who had given her a vehicle, but she couldn't use it because she didn't have a license. So no license we go to health we don't she has no um no health insurance no uh benefits at all so she she wasn't receiving any health benefits nor her children and i'm like well why you would definitely qualify let's get this going but again we we were met with a barrier and you're probably catching a theme that she didn't have the proper identification you need to file a for any of those benefits. Okay, so then obviously the safety is, we're, we're looking at the safety of her and her kids. There was a history of that DV in this family. And a lot of that was because, like we, like we were talking about in the previous presentation, she was just trying to survive and make ends meet. So she would live with people who weren't the safest to be able to pay her bills or them to pay her bills. So that didn't work. She um, this is a generational thing for her. So we're at support. She doesn't have um, any positive supports in her life that are appropriate for her and her children. So she doesn't have um, no family around. The family that she does have were not appropriate and they are not local. So then we get down to life skills and we realize she's really stuck in a fight or flight kind of life skill situation. She's not She's a fighter, she's just trying to get it to the next day. And that's never going to create a stable home life environment. So as we continued, this ID thing kept coming back up and we're like, what's going on here? So come to find out um, after some digging and we're about six months in at this point thinking, okay, we need to, we'll just get you an ID, that's easy enough. You know, I've done that when I got married, I had to change over. So we'll just go down there, we'll pay a little fee and we'll, we'll move right along. Well, it's funny, to get a copy of your identification, you actually have to have another form of identification. And so again, I know that you guys have all been here because it's, it's a super frustrating process. And so you're sitting there and we're like, okay, we'll, we'll go, let's go find one. Well, she doesn't even have, they're like maybe a bill in her name. Well, she didn't have bills in her name because she couldn't have them. So she had landlords that had it and that's how she got in the cycle in the first place. So, okay, we're gonna go back to the drawing board. We need, we need an ID. So she wasn't local. She wasn't even from the United States. Um, she was legally here. We knew that, but we had no idea how we were going to get this main paperwork. So we, like I said, we were able to stabilize for now, a Band-Aid with some temporary financial assistance. It was a big part of her success in the long run. Um, we kept going back and forth. So we finally were like, okay, let's start with the birth certificate. Well, this was a very unique situation to this area. She had to have a checking account in her name with the money drafted out of that account to apply for the birth certificate. So most of our communities, they're not having a checking account in their name. She doesn't have this kind of money. So we go and we find ourselves a bank and we're gonna open up her first checking account except you probably guessed you have to have id and you can't put that in so here we are like finally thought we had an answer but we can't actually get her a checking account because she does not have id so this id thing became a much bigger issue um, in the long run than we could have ever imagined so i'm working on another case it's child welfare related and i i'm i'm doing some stuff helping the mom get her kids registered for school 
And in the file, I see that there's an ID for this, for the child. And I thought, huh, she doesn't have parents, but she went to school at some point. So somewhere, somebody had some kind of identification and it was kind of a long shot, but we got some releases and I had an MSW um, student assigned to me. So we were working together and uh, we did some digging and we finally found and we got some releases and we called these places. And um, most people were like, that was, you know, this wasn't a very young mom. That was way long time ago. That was, you're, you're asking me to look for 20 years ago. We don't have that. It's not online. Like we, we don't have that. So um, pretty defeated. I, at this point, if I, it wasn't for the MSW student with me, I'm pretty sure I would have had to give up because I just thought this is hopeless. We're not going to get there. And I'm the professional in this situation. This mom is frustrated. She has lost her temper. She has said things to people. So I'm trying to model pro-social skills, but I'm also frustrated because this nowhere we turn seems to um, seems to have an answer. It's all just negatives. And so we can't help her get anywhere different than where she is because she's stuck with this one seemingly small issue. So about a year into the case where mom has some, she's, like I said, she's a fighter, she's a survivor. She's gotten some income by working a deal out with the landlord and this and that, you know, she's, she's, she's trying to make it work. This is not a lack of will on her part. Um, and I get a call and it's from some lady that the story resonated with at the school. And she's like, look, anytime I've had a chance over the last four months, I've been looking to see if I could find some kind of identification. Well, she found one, she, this little tiny thing, it was very blurry, but she scanned it right over. And so then we were like, okay, we can do this. We're, we're back on. We find a, we finally found a local, no bank, but it was a credit union that would accept this form of identification. It wasn't their typical, um, what you would open with a checking account. So it was so nice and then we're so excited, except that they wanted to charge her about triple what it would cost um, myself to go in and open a checking account with the proper identification. So they were doing her a favor by charging her triple to have, and that's how they viewed it. So, um, so then a whole new story, how are we going to put this, you know, grant money can't, and funder money can't put money into someone's checking account. So what are we going to do here? This is now not only the cost of the actual birth certificate, but the cost of just opening the account. So thankfully at 90 Works, we do have very, very small of unrestricted funding for, from donations and things like that. So Kate, our CEO approved it and we, and we put that in her account. So six months later, so around a year and a half, we finally get a birth certificate for this mom. That is the most overly, overly simplified version of this story I could give you. It was hard for all of us. We were tired. We were frustrated. Um, I was pretty disappointed in the, the system of itself because there was no, um, there was no way to win. We couldn't help this mom get a win. And finally, a year and a half later, we did, we were able to do that. It was um, one of the things what we talk about with life skills is the things we take for granted. So for me personally, it was a wake up call because I remember very, um, very clearly my mom giving me this pretty little file and telling me, here's all of your, you're a grown up now, here's all of your stuff, your birth certificate, you know, copies of your IDs, your social security, all of it was in this little thing. And she's like, and you'll need to keep this and you'll need to put your husband's in it. And when you have kids, and I still have that today and my kids stuff is in it and it's in a safe spot. And she taught me how important that was, but that was not something um, that this mom was set up with. She did not have, she wasn't set up for success in that way. So a lot of times we end up even in our systems with that stigma of, um, I was just talking to some peers today and they said, you know, the, the way our family, like, why don't they just get a job and keep it? Or why don't they just pay their bills first? Or why do, why do they have a nice car, but they don't have, you know, and they have all of these, these answers. And well, yeah, I mean, if they did pay their bills, they probably wouldn't get evicted, but it's not usually that they've just budgeted poorly is not the root cause. Now they may need budgeting. That's a life skill that we all need. And I, I always need more budgeting skills, but they, they weren't set up that way. We are, we're dealing with generational chronic homelessness in this situation. And um, 
she this she knew no different she didn't know you were supposed to have all of those things so now she has her toolbox she has her kit she has her identification she gets a job that is stable and pays much better we get the kids into um we still don't have transportation at this time but they were able to now get picked up she because she qualified for benefits which made her qualify for some of these um daycare um transportation so everything just finally after a year and a half started really fitting together and this mom became successful we have a um way that we follow up with some of our customers which we did and we kept up with this mom for a while and she someone who um, had her rights terminated which usually they don't have success in the with other children that it just is a it's a hard situation she has not been back into the child welfare system she has not been evicted she is successful and she's providing for her children and it was something as silly and simple as just having the right ids to be able to access the resources she needed in the community to to get into that entry level, just like we were seeing in that first presentation, is that if we can't, if that, if we're stuck in this middle part, she was, she wasn't just stuck there, she was stuck at even getting anything she could rent. So she now has a job that they put money straight into her bank account and she's not having to go ask someone to cash things for her. And you just, it, it, everything began to fell together for this mom. So I think the point is, I think all of us can relate to a story like this. She's just one of many, of course, that um, I've worked with along the way, but she always stuck out to me because she was such a fighter. You know, I don't think anything that we did with this would be considered rocket science. I mean, it was pretty simple. It became very evident that she needed the identification. There wasn't an aha, uh -huh, but what it took was persistence. And this wasn't something that this mom could have done by just pulling up her pants and doing a better job like people wanted to to view her as like if you just tried harder mom like if you just stuck with it mom if you just fill in the blank um you could fix it and so obviously we see that we the system itself is very broken and and a lot of times disjointed and not connected and what we realize here when we're looking at these matrix areas for 90 works is they're so interconnected and whether the system recognizes them as being connected can be a problem but in real life they are they they all go hand in hand in circuit one and in our areas pensacola is one of the only places that has a transportation system everywhere else is very spread out so when in the earlier presentation when he's talking about sidewalks i'm like there isn't even anything to walk to you could have a sidewalk but where are they going so like they there's there's not just a place where they can just go get a job as easily as some of these other places so we deal with very specific needs here in northwest florida because they um we don't have we can't just give them a card to get them started at that first job you know they're they're having to utilize friends and ride sharing which gas money so you're still we're still talking cost and an unreliable person because a friend can choose to do something else that day than take you to work so as we begin to look at all of these areas of the matrix and really get people to understand okay i i can provide this for myself then we really are setting them up for some success i one of the things i think that um we used to tell people, and this is up until January, if you wanted a job in the area, we'll help you get a job. If you're willing to work, we'll find, we'll help you find one. Um, but we're facing a new problem, obviously, today after um, the COVID-19 pandemic, things are tough. They're not as easy to get the job. Um, there's less TFA um, or temporary financial assistance in the community in the sense of um, informal places. So if they um to really do that prevention for some people maybe calling a church my husband's an associate pastor churches are taking a hit during this covid as well as congregations are so they're they're not able to do maybe some of the things they are and so the list continues i had a mom call our church and my husband connected her to me she didn't qualify for any of our services at 90 works so I was just trying to help navigate for her, tell her about some resources. Um, this mother was different. She was situationally um, homeless, not chronic. She had never been homeless before. And uh, it was all due to she lost her job. Um, 
due to COVID-19, she was a guardian to her grandchildren and it just wasn't working. She couldn't find, um, she was met at, I, I don't know, it was somewhere in our, our area of care because she had called some numbers and someone had mentioned something to her like when they, when she was applying for funds said, well, if I help you feed your grandkids, I won't be able to feed my grandkids tonight. And so when she talked to me, she was defeated. She was crying. She's like, she was embarrassed because she thought this, I can't believe I would never ask anybody for, um, you know, for them to sacrifice like that for me. I just don't know what to do. I'm at my wits end. I'm going to give up. And so it's, finding the what her root cause was well for her it was this very specific COVID COVID issue she had put a deposit down she was ready to move in had everything down her monthly she had her monthly income worked out but because of COVID they weren't doing walkthroughs at the apartment so she couldn't get the signature we were just waiting on a physical signature to get her in to stable housing so here she is a grandma having all these kiddos that she's guardian of right now in a hotel room that um you know that was only made for a few people and we they and she lived there for months and so once we finally, you know, the system kind of caught up to COVID and they did some virtual things, she was able to get into that housing. But we, but we know that's coming more and more and more. We're not going to have TFA from churches. We do have, some people are getting um, CARES Act money, which is great, but those are very specific, you know, sometimes have very specific rigid funding rules, um, which is why it's nice to have those informal supports that you can use um, to, to meet the specific need, because it's not, not always going to be the same thing. And there's less jobs. There's just not jobs right now that like there were. Um, and so we don't know when or if they will come back after. Uh, so the people that we would call and be like, hey, I got someone, so they're really ready to work. Can you, can you get them a job? Well, right now they may not even have a job because that's the, that's the reality of the world we're living in. Um, the burden of maintaining a home and stable housing is on the customer or the client that we're working with, of course. But truthfully, in the first presentation just goes with this so beautifully because it's not just that they have a lack of willpower on the part of the population we're serving. They may have a lack of willpower now because they've, they've experienced this for so long and they're tired and they're frustrated and they've not had a win. So I hope, um, so I think we have to challenge ourselves. We have to challenge ourselves because when we say something like transitioning out of homelessness, that can be overly simplistic in just a few words when the process itself is so intricate and so long and hard and they have to use life skills they've never been taught. If you call and cuss out the landlord, that's probably not going to get you into that place but you can advocate for yourself and there's ways to do that. So it's a process. It's a learning. It's a partnership between you and that customer. And I know that y'all know this. This is a calling. This job isn't for everyone. People get in here and they hear that story and they're like, I'm out of here. That's not for me. I'm not doing that. And then others, yes, this is me. I, I want to help. I want to meet them. I want to partner. So um, I hope that's you today. I hope that you, um, want to partner with our families and want to serve the community and help see them be stably and safe housed, but not just for the sake of being housed, but because it brings stability to their whole life. Ninety Works does, um, we do do a training on a more in-depth intro. It's a free webinar for our Project 90 um, matrix areas. I don't, I don't want to oversell it though. We, we don't always have success. Of course, we still have people who fall off and aren't, um, who aren't committed or aren't ready. Maybe they're, they're still in a cycle of trauma or abuse and violence and they can't, they can't make that break to be ready to, to make some of these changes because you really have to be ready in that. And in the stages of change, you have to, to be willing and observant that something has to change in their life. So Obviously, this isn't like a magic wand. We, we can't go in there. But when you have a person who wants to and is trying, getting to the root of the issue, because it would have looked really nice on the surface and just say to this mom, this mom just needs to get a job. 
this mom just needs to da, da, da. and we're and, the, and we can even fall into that cycle because we're hearing it so much from people who aren't in it with us who aren't in the who aren't in the trenches if you will of of working with this population and again as we keep hearing and i'm sure it's just going to be the trend of today is how much we're impacted by what is available in the community i hope that um my story has been somewhat meaningful to you today. I look forward to working with the communities um, in, in our community together. I think that um, just like we were saying with the disjointed, I think if community partners and we, we try to bring our part of the system more um, integrated and I see that we are like something like this is a great forum for that and continuing to do it in the future, that that's when we can really um, help our families because we're not just putting a bandaid and we're not just putting them in there for a moment, but we're using those fundings with a purpose to get them to their next step. We'll have a learning curve with um, after the COVID-19, obviously. Um, we're gonna have to figure out what a new normal looks like here in Pensacola and how, how just how big the impact is going to be once we, um, when things pick back up, hopefully. So, Thank you for your time today. I do actually have to cut checks later. So I think they said we'll do question answers now instead of later because I'm going to have to leave. But it, like I said, I hope today was meaningful. You know, it is deeply meaningful to he us here at 90 Works. And I know that it's a special calling for people um, who work in this community. So, so thank you for all your hard work and let me be a part of it. Thank you so much, Paige. Uh, that was that was a very interesting presentation that you gave us, and and we do have a few questions. You answered uh, some of the questions. One of them was talked about uh, people on the lower end of the housing continuum, particularly homelessness, uh, situational homeless and chronic homeless, and and do they require more case management? Your unique story, I think, says yes to that. If you need to add something else to it, please let me know. <laughs> Well, I mean, yes, definitely. There's not a, um, you know, a magic wand that just makes all their problems go away. And there is a lot of persistence. Um, but what we realize if we can, if we can get them to buy in, it really shows about 90 days if you're on the right way to success, or if, you know, if we're, if we're both equally committed to, to seeing them, you know, safe and stably housed. The, the other question I have is it, it talks or speaks to the six areas of the domains that you talked about, the housing, income, transportation, health, safety, and support, and life skills as well, because those are uh -huh. small together are barriers. My, my question here talks about you all particularly don't have all of the resources to address all of the people who come through your doors in these particular areas. Do you currently partner with specific organizations or do you partner with the town or any one city uh, along those lines to, to provide those services? Yeah, well, we'll partner with anybody that wants to partner because that's the idea. Yeah, we do have, um, like most places we have limited, our funding is limited to certain populations. So like one of them is um, veteran, homeless veteran families um, or veterans. And we have a specific um, financial area where we work with children, like families who are in the um, child welfare system, so that's specific. Um, our CEO, Kate, she is very passionate about uh, fundraising outside of, so we have unrestricted funding. Obviously, it's not, um, that doesn't come pouring in like you would hope. So we do have that when those situations arise, but you're right, there's not. And so it does take a level of partnering with people finding out, reaching out to the community to figure out. We do have several churches that have um, assist along the way that's really helped when um, kind of like they know that, okay, we're going to, we're going to partner with you because we know that they're working hard to, you know, to, to better themselves. Well, thank you for that, ma'am. I, I do have one other question I think I want to try to get in because it has two, two or three lights on it. Can you expand upon how house, housing, stable and affordable housing affects all aspects of a person or family's life? I, I, I want to make sure this was one that was directed at you. And if you can answer it, I'd really appreciate it because I know you have to get off the line and go cut those checks. If not, I'll make sure I direct it towards the rest of the, rest of the oh, um, question. Sure. So housing, um, one way that when we, we started with this that our, um, our CEO said it was, you know, 
how can you go to a job that pays well and is stable and reliable, right? That what we want if you can't shower or if you can't feed your children or if y'all slept in a car or if continue. Having the housing um, is definitely important. And so when we can use temporary financial assistance, if it's not something that they have at their disposal income right now, is finding them that stable. Because until I, I, I often joke in the interviews I had with Kate along the way that um, it's really a model that Jesus used. And I say that because he, even Jesus met people's physical needs before he shared his story with people. So when he fed the 5,000, when he turned the water, you know, so when you're looking at it, sometimes you have to meet people's basic needs. And we see that in Maslow's hierarchy of needs as well, that before we can expect any kind of self-actualization, they have to be able to know that their kids are going to be safe tonight or themselves, you know, that they're not going to be um, at, in harm that night. And so there's a lot, especially when you're dealing with generational, they are scared. They know like they are not going to a shelter for any reason like that, because a lot of them have experienced things at shelters. So there, it has a stigma for them. So um, there's a lot of reasons, obviously, but if you have a safe place to rest your head, it doesn't, like we said earlier, it can be small. It doesn't have to be fancy, but just somewhere that's safe for them to begin to think outside of um, that survival mode, that fight or flight to, to be able to, to look at the big picture and calm down, you know, the calming long enough to see, okay, yeah, I really do need a better job or I really do need, um, to move somewhere where I have access to transportation and support. Well, Paige, as always, I appreciate you for coming on and helping us out with our summer here today. Let Kate know I said hello and thank you for allowing you to, to come on. If we have any other follow-up questions, I'm sure Kristen will, will submit those to you for your answers. And we appreciate you for, for your involvement in today's summit. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a great, great day. So I would like to transition now to our next participant who's stepping up. I do see him on the line, Mr. Abe Singh. He's the Executive Director of Area Housing Commission. So Abe, a public, which is a public housing organization, his group provides low-income housing to families who meet income guidelines. They currently manage 12 public housing properties, and while Abe and his group are well aware of the need for emergency housing, families often take longer to transition to home ownership. This creates a deeper need as the number of available properties continue to be outpaced by the number of families eligible for his program. Abe received his PhD in clinical medical psychology and administration from Walden University. He served as a chaplain in the U.S. Army before setting his sights on serving 10 years as the Executive Director of Hospital Administration and Behavioral Health at the Madigan Army Hospital in Tacoma, Washington. Abe also served as a hospital administrator for Grady Hospital in, in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Singh began his career with the Area Housing Commission in 2009 and brings a wealth of knowledge and experience providing housing solutions to Stanley County residents. Welcome, Mr. Abe. Please talk to us about hood housing, sir. Sure, absolutely. Hi, Marcy. <laughs> oh, did I mute? Okay. So uh, we are public housing, as Al mentioned. Uh, I always, I always begin any any type of a presentation by saying that we are public housing, and we are not uh, affordable housing institution. Uh, residents that live with us cannot afford affordable housing. Oh, you know, obviously, uh, public housing is uh, subsidized uh, by HUD. Uh, we have about 721 active units right now uh, that are rented, and uh, we have close to 900 individuals and families on the waiting list uh, waiting for public housing, so you can you can look at the disparity of of, of uh, how many people are waiting for housing, and and the fact remains that we don't have ample housing to house everyone. Uh, our rent uh, 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 is uh, uh, is subsidized. Excuse me. Uh, exclusively by, by HUD, uh, we, have, we have a minimum rent 
of $50 a month uh, and anywhere up to, up to $300 a month, you know, depending upon the 30% ratio, uh, I'm sorry, 80% of the ratio. Uh, so uh, we have a long waiting list and, uh, and Escambia County and the city of Pensacola, we do not have enough public housing. That's, that's the main root of, of, uh, of uh, one cause of homelessness. Uh, we have, we have, uh, we have mothers, we, uh, our, our, uh, our largest population uh, are single mothers with, uh, with one, two, three, four, five, up to nine children per household. Uh, and uh, we partner with outside agencies to give, uh, you know, classes to, to, uh, to uh, you know, complete GED programs. Uh, but one of the biggest problems that we encounter is transportation with our residents. That's one. The other one is that they don't have driver's licenses. That's another huge uh, impediment uh, to finding employment. Uh, we do employ residents uh, to work in public housing part-time, and that is called Section 3. Uh, <clears throat> we, we deal with a lot of other problems in public housing throughout the nation, but just to mention uh, Area Housing Commission, we, we, uh, we have our share of... of, uh, of uh, uh, criminal activities on our campuses. Uh, we, we, uh, we hire uh, PPD police officers uh, seven days a week. We also hire uh, the sheriff's department uh, to survey and to, and, to, uh, and to look after the safety of our, uh, of our residents at Marino Court. Uh, <clears throat> one of the problems here right now, we do work very closely with Habitat uh, for humanity, we you know we work very closely with Mass uh, you know with Massey's program, uh, Section Eight, uh, uh, you know housing choice voucher. We have a partnership with uh, with Massey's program, and we also have a great partnership with Ninety Works and Catholic Charities uh, and Community Action and all of the non-profit organizations as well. But simply put, the city of Pensacola and Escambia County, we do not have enough housing for the working poor and for very low income uh, residents or population group. Uh, we are in the midst of right now, uh, we have hired a, a, uh, a developer and we are going to, to build anywhere between 70 and 90 units, uh, 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 you know, both in the Scambia County area one is going to be an old Corey Field Road, and the other one is going to be on on uh, uh, on Mobile Highway, uh, uh, you know, right close to uh, a Home Depot. So, uh, you know, construction is going to begin next year. We have already selected a, a developer and 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 um, uh, 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 and everything is moving in the right direction. Uh, as far as as far as housing is concerned, uh, the population we deal with basically uh, have a huge educational deficit problem. Uh, reading and writing is a huge uh, cumbersome uh, problem for our residents seeking uh, 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 housing or who are already in, in, um, uh, in public housing. Uh, as far as Escambia County and the city of Pensacola is concerned, uh, uh, the medium income to buy a home in, uh, in Escambia County is $170,000. Uh, when, when, when the medium, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, wages, in Escambia County is around 
thousand dollars, and you can you can look at the difference uh, 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 that that if you are making twenty five thousand dollars a year, it's very difficult to save twenty percent down for a home that you are buying for one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. There is no way you can you can do that, and thereby increasing more families and individuals who are uh, uh, who are incapable of of, uh, of purchasing their home, and and uh, and lately, you know, we've been embarking on the fact that, you know, that a family should you know set aside uh, thirty percent of their earned income to pay their mortgage, but this percentage has gone up to fifty just recently by the Harvard research, and now it's fifty percent if you include mortgage insurances. And living here in Pensacola, you're looking at uh, hurricane insurances uh, and 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 uh, and just everyday, uh, you know, maintenance of of your uh, of your home. And this is where Habitat for Humanity comes in, uh, 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 you know, very gloriously, who are helping our you know, our family who are who are who are who are who are struggling. And Habitat uh, uh, is able to manufacture and produce homes uh, uh, at much lower cost of $200 a square feet or $150 a square feet. Uh, rent nowadays has gone up much higher. And I'm sure Marcy is going to talk about this if you look at fair market rent. If you look at a two or three bedroom fair market rent, your rent is going to be higher than if you know, as if you were owning a home and your mortgage payment is five or six hundred dollars a month. Uh, and if you look at fair market uh, uh, for one bedroom, uh, it's close to six hundred. Two bedroom is close to seven hundred and something. And a three bedroom is eight hundred plus. So rent is going up. Simultaneously, the prices of our homes are going up. So where does this leave the population that we are working with? Uh, we leave, you know, we're leaving them in a very precarious position. Uh, so HUD has said to us that they are not going to allow us to build any more public housing. And this is true for Area Housing Commission, and it is also true for our entire nation. If we want to add housing, we have to do this on our own. And that's what I was talking about just a little while ago. But then if we do that, and when we do that, uh, you know, our rent is not going to be reflective of public housing, where if you have zero income, your rent is $50. Uh, 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 so, so this is not going to copycat the rent of public housing. Uh, this, is going to be, this is going to be a higher rent, you know, thereby again leaving the population that Area Housing Commission works with, and these are the, uh, uh, you know, the unemployed and, and individuals and families who are working part-time. Uh, and then, of course, now don't forget that we do have, uh, uh, you know, a group of uh, very hardworking individuals who are working full-time and they're paying, uh, you know, rent up to six, seven hundred dollars a month. These are the individuals who are working full-time and the select to live in public housing. Uh, you know, home ownership, in my experience, has gone down and the rental prices have gone up. So this is another fight that, uh, that we, uh, uh, as community leaders, are also facing. How do we, how do we go about assisting our individuals uh, for job training, uh, uh, transportation, uh, 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 these are the impediments that the families we try to help and house are facing. Uh, that's all I have, Al, for right now. These are just a breakdown in the hardcore facts about public housing. Yes, sir. Hey, that, those were indeed hardcore facts. Um, you, you shed a light on a lot of things, uh, including the number of units you have available, but the number of people who are on the waiting list. You talked about having 720 plus units, but you have 900 individuals who are actually on the waiting list. 
What do you say to those individuals who are waiting and, and you know that they're, they're in a desperate situation? What do you say to them? Yeah, we, you know, we sincerely and humbly apologize that we don't have enough, uh, enough, enough units to give them. And of course, we place them on the waiting list and very, you know, frankly speaking, uh, uh, you know, our waiting list is around two years before a family or an individual comes up to be housed. Uh, uh, and the most popular unit is a one bedroom. Uh, and then of course, the second one is a two bedroom. Uh, we, we, you know, we, 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 uh, we try to work with our family. We, uh, we work with the homeless coalition. Uh, we work with 90 works and, and, uh, uh, Masi is also facing the same type of problem. She doesn't have enough vouchers for the population that is in need of vouchers. Similar to us, we don't have enough housing for the population who's looking for housing. And these are the people who are living from family members, jumping couches here and there uh, with their children. And, and we know very well that, that no housing, lack of proper housing, and unsafe housing contributes to individuals, parents, and children's mental health, psychological health, nutritional problems, uh, academic problems, and I'm sure, uh, you know, Council Lady Jewel is gonna address that section. But these are the issues we are dealing with right now, and we try to help our, 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 our families to partner with nonprofit and outside agencies, Al. Thank you for that as well. I, you know, I was going to touch a little bit because that was a question about the organizations you currently partner with, but you kind of just mentioned it. You know, you talk to partner with organizations who, who deal with a, a number of issues that your families face, uh, whether it be their it's education, whether it be safety and things along those lines, you, you currently work with them. Has it been hard or difficult for you to form those partnerships? Do you see that those partnerships maybe not have as many resources as you would particularly need to address your family issues? Uh, uh, all, of, uh, all of the nonprofit organizations that Area Housing Commission works with, uh, we have a wonderful relationship, you all, very good relationship, a working relationship, a very congenial relationship. Uh, uh, but you, we also have to understand as, as as, uh, as Charles was talking, the first speaker, uh, uh, our cities and our county, well, our city and our county is not developed uh, to the stage of providing employment to all individuals who are seeking employment. Our city just does not have the resources and our county does not have the resources. And then of course, we're dealing with a section of population who have, who have criminal backgrounds and they are, they, you know, they have impediments uh, being hired by companies as we all know, and they are blackballed uh, uh, in many cases. Now HUD has come up that, that, uh, that we are going to provide housing to everyone, uh, uh, you know, regardless of, 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 uh, uh, of what type of criminal background they have, except for pedophiles and aggressive armed robbery. These two groups uh, bring threat and danger to the population. And that's where we, we are unable to help that type of groups of people. But the rest, yes, HUD has lifted the ban and we can, and we can house them, providing we have enough housing. But we have a tremendous relationship Right now, I'm working so exclusively with Doug Brown at the Community Action uh, CEO. They have received uh, 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 ample funding for our individuals due to coronavirus that have been late or, or, or were not able to pay their rent. Now we are referring them to Community Action and they are paying their rent for, you know, for the time being until this, until this pandemic is over. So that's the kind of relationship we have, Al. Well, that, that is excellent because those resources are, they're coming into our community and, and for them to be dispersed to those, to those families who need them most is a very excellent thing that's being done. 
I, I do want to kind of touch base because you mentioned about you were building or you have someone contract to build 90 units. In your estimation, those 90 new units will make what impact or on your weight list? Uh, good question. <laughs> that uh, that is going to be uh, that is going to be affordable housing. Hell, uh, that uh, that is not going to be subsidized in any way or form by HUD. That is a standalone uh, uh, project. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and basically you will, you will need an income of one kind or another to, 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 to be able to rent uh, from this new uh, uh, units that we are going to be building next year. Okay. Thank you for that, sir. I'm scrolling through trying to see if there are any other questions here. Um, you, you, you talked a little bit about um, society or, or Florida, Pensacola not being set up for people getting jobs and other issues along those lines that really goes back to the situation that your people are actually in right now because it's a direct hindrance of them getting affordable housing, getting into your housing. What what did you say or what have you or who have you talked to or reached out to to say this is an issue and this is how we should potentially set up to solve this or resolve this issue? Well, uh, we have to attract we have to attract uh, 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 different types of employment that can look at different talents and different backgrounds. Uh, you know the population I deal with. Uh, uh, we have uh, we have a lot of uh, 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 individuals who have not finished a high school, and they do have impediments and problems in reading and writing. Uh, and we will have to find some type of employment, or do some job training so they can come up to par to meet the requirements of this job. I think I, th I think that I think the county and the city uh, should should you know should look at this seriously and begin to you know talk to people like us and 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 see what kind of population we are dealing with groups of population and what types of 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 uh, of, um, of impediments they are bringing to you know the employment uh, workforce and how we can help them to train or to retrain so they are marketable Thank you so much for that and for your presentation, sir. If you will stick around with us, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm sure we're going to have a Q&A at the end of this session. And perhaps uh, you being a functioning practitioner, you'll be able to answer some of those questions. So I really appreciate you for, for presenting today and, and really appreciate you more if you will stick around to the end of this. I will. I will. I'll be right here. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, and we, we're going to transition to the dynamic duo, but before we transition to the dynamic duo, we're going to I want to make sure you all know to submit your, your comments in the, in the Q&A section so we can actually ask the functioning practitioner those things that you're talking about that you want to know. Also, at the end of this, if you email info at PensacolaHabitat.org, we will make sure that we get you a copy or a link to the recorded webinar, just in case someone was unable to, to view it at the view it live. So, uh, it is info at PensacolaHabitat.org, and I'm sure uh, Kristen has already put that in the in the chat somewhere. So, having said that, I want to make sure I'm being being, res being real respectful of your time and the participants. I want to move on to those dynamic duo who have been waiting around so patiently for us, and give them a warm welcome. I, right now, coming up, I would like to introduce Jewel Canada Wynn and City Council President, District Seven. City Councilwoman Jewel Canada Wynn was elected to represent District 7 in November 2012. She currently serves as president. The Century Florida native has served the Pensacola community as a chairperson of the Community Redevelopment Agency, as a board member on Community Enterprise Investments Incorporated, Westside Redevelopment Board, and the Florida Alabama Transportation Planning Organization. After graduating high school, Councilwoman Canada Wynn served our country as a security as security forces specialist in the United States Air Force. Despite seeing the world, her roots and connection to Northwest Florida remain deep. 
She ventured back home to earn an MA in teaching history and applied her passion in the Stanley County School District for over 25 years. I'm sure that her three children and six grandchildren are the crown jewels of Jewel's career in public service. However, in my opinion, her recent 2020 God and Government Award at the 44th Annual Government of Prayer Breakfast ranks pretty high as well on her list. The other half of the dynamic duo is Marcy Whitaker, who has been a resident of the city of Pensacola for over 20 years. She has over 14 years of experience in the affordable housing and community development field. Currently, Marcy serves as the director for the City of Pensacola Housing Office, which provides program oversight and administration for the city's community development block grant, Home Partnership Act, and the State Housing Initiative Partnership. These grants funds are used to support all manner of affordable housing initiatives and community enhancement projects undertaken within the city. Additionally, the Housing Office administers the Section 8 Housing Choice Vouchers and HUD Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Programs providing rental assistance to approximately 2,400 participants throughout Stanley County. Prior to entering, pub entering public service, Whitaker had 10 years of experience in the environmental consulting industry. She received her Bachelor of Arts and Master of Business Administration from the University of South Alabama in Mobile, Go Jags. The two are leading an aggressive affordable housing campaign of 500 homes in five years. Thank you ladies for joining us today Talk to us about workforce housing. You now have the floor, ladies. Okay, thank you. Um, we appreciate being invited to participate in this. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit first, and then the councilwoman will chime in, I'm sure. We don't have a fancy presentation. Okay. So you're just going to have to listen to us talk. I have to say that one of the things I, um, when Paige was talking, I had to stop myself and think, where are all my important documents? Do I have my birth certificate? Where are those things? Because it is so true in our community, if you're doing anything to establish yourself, those documents are critical. So I appreciated her pointing that out. You can't hear me? Oh, okay. Do I need to move up? Is that better? No. Can y'all hear me okay? You're a little bit low. I don't know if you can turn your mic up just a little bit, a tad bit. Um, Is that better? Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. I'll sit up closer, too. Um, the council president came to me last year, actually, with this wonderful vision and she had a wonderful goal and it was 500 homes in five years. And she was so excited about it and she really wanted to address the need for affordable housing in our community. So she and I started working together. Um, she we came up with a group of subject matter, matter experts in our, air, in our community that council appointed. We held our first meeting in February and then due to the virus, things were kind of put on hold for a little while. Then we reconvened in June and um, also put in place the Florida Housing Coalition, which is an advocacy group that's known statewide for being kind of a, again, a subject matter expert and a leader in our community and in the state for affordable housing issues. We hired them to kind of facilitate the process for us. And in June, they came forward with a, a database, kind of painting a picture of where we are in Pensacola and what that means and where the gaps are and things that maybe we could look at to address some of those needs. And I will agree with Chuck that the current model really does revolve around income. You know, your income kind of drives how much house you can afford. In our community, as Abe pointed out, a lot of the folks in our community don't have big incomes. So when an average home in our community costs $200,000, that really is out of the price range. Where most people, you know, for a low income family, you're talking about something that's between $125,000 to $130,000. And for a moderate income family, you're talking about something that's right around $190,000. So obviously there is a need for us to address at that presentation, we talked about kind of what we've been doing historically. What have we been bringing to the community? And we were able to identify that over the last several years, we've produced about 
50 units. Now those units also include homes that we've done rehab on. And I kind of like keeping that component in there because that addresses the fact that we want to keep our neighborhoods intact. We don't want to do some of those models that Chuck was showing us where, you know, you have your lovely home and then they build a 20 story condo right next door, which completely changes the look of your neighborhood. So we've concentrated on rehab and then also on new construction and new construction really has been through our partnerships. And again, I'll agree with Abe that the partnerships are very, very important to make all our dollars go further to help our citizens meet the resources they need to get to the individuals that can help them. And some of those partnerships, we've actually had Habitat, um, Escambia Housing, Housing Finance Authority. We work very, very closely with Escambia County, the um, Neighborhood Enterprise Division there at Escambia County to make sure that we are producing the units that we need. The last task force meeting we had was in July and in July they went through a group of recommendations and I want to say there were probably maybe as many as 20 recommendations and the committee kind of narrowed it down to six that they're going to concentrate on that will be brought forward at their last meeting um, August 27th. That's a Thursday. It'll be live streamed on the city's website at 3.30 so anybody's welcome to join and watch. And the six areas that they identified that really we should concentrate on moving forward are um, engaging our strategic partners, which again, we've all talked about how important that partnership is, collaborating with the private sectors to identify incentives that will help private sector produce those um, necessary affordable units, leverage our existing city properties. And we had a long discussion about possibly using pieces or portions of some of the city parks, just being more creative with some of the parcels maybe that the city still owns. Um, support tax credit development. And that is where um, a private investor comes in and builds a unit and then they are rented at a certain income level to certain income individuals. One of the newest ones going up right now is Vista 17 on Cervantes Street. There's one kind of right across the street from it actually, that is the Inglewood Seniors Towers. Both of those are tax credit projects. Um, identify suitable sites for small unit development. And I think there the task force was really looking at something that we all tend to forget about and it really does help build that gap or build that bridge. You know, not everything has to be either an apartment complex or a single family home. It could be something like a duplex, a triplex, a quadplex, something where you're housing more individuals, but could still very easily blend in with the fabric of our neighborhoods. And then adaptive reuse of former sites. And there they were talking about taking some of the old retail parcels that are vacant now, redoing those for either apartment or townhome development or condominium development, the councilwoman and I even looked at some of the church properties and things like that in our communities that are now vacant. Some way that we could possibly reuse those and put those into use for affordable housing. Um, Abe is right that the fair market rents and rents in our community have gone up. A fair market rent for a two bedroom unit right now is $954. So, that does include, when we talk fair market rent, HUD is talking rent plus utilities. So if you back out the utilities, you're, we're probably somewhere around $800 or so for a two bedroom unit. But the other piece of that fair market rent, it is based on 40% of what market rate is renting for. So that means 60% of our market is renting for more than that $800 a unit. <laughs> So it is very expensive right now for people to look for units. Um, again, I'll kind of echo what everybody said. This is going to be a new time for our community as a whole and how we come through this and come out on the other side of the COVID environment is going to be telling for us. I think we have some challenges that we're going to be meeting in the near future when some of the eviction moratoriums and foreclosure moratoriums are lifted. So I think 
the task force, the proposals they brought forward, some of the things that they're hoping to put into place and address is at a very timely and excellent point for us to be doing this. And the other thing, the councilwoman, I don't want to take her thunder because I'm sure she has things she wants to add, but the other thing she has asked us to do is actually not just do a study, not just do another study and set it on the shelf. She wants actual things that we're going to be implementing coming out of this moving forward to make a difference in our community. And that kind of sums up my quick little summary. I'll be glad to turn it over to Council President Canada Wynn. All right, thank you. Marcia, can you hear me? I think you're muted, Councilwoman. Yes, ma'am, you're muted. You're unmuted now. Okay, I'm on. You can hear me. All right. The, I wanted to go back just a little bit because about six years ago, we started what we call a housing initiative with the city of Pensacola. And every piece of property that we sold, we kind of put it in a little fund. And then that little fund was to, to help with housing and workforce housing. And so that we had no direction as to how to get into the workforce housing area. Uh, and so that is how we started looking at a task force to be able to help us look at what our options were and alternatives. The 500 just came up as a way of keeping momentum because normally if you just do a study or you don't put some parameters in there, you kind of just forget about it. So I like to put a number to things. So that's that's how we got the 500. Of course, I wanted more, but the mayor and uh, Marcy just said I was just too much of a visionary here. That was going to be too 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 much. And so that's when we got together. With, uh, like Marcy stated, that that we're gonna, we sat down and talked about how we are going to address workforce housing as an educator. And you working and working really hard. I had teachers who would say. Well, you know, Jewel, I, I would love to move there. I can't afford it. So if you, your baseline salary, even at $37,000 as an educator, uh, they could not afford to, to live. So this is how it has evolved into how do we make a difference here at the city with workforce uh, housing. I, I wanted to also, you know, piggyback on the, the idea of our kids. Uh, I'm a dean, and so sometimes when kids come into your office with disciplinary issues, they are just not disciplinary issues. Normally, there are th other things that are going on in their lives, and so our young people react. You know, they don't have the skills yet to cope with some of these things, and so they react. And I remember one incident, you know, the, the kids were coming out of the house, and the sheriff's office is at the house, and they're putting the eviction notice. So the babies are getting ready to, to go come to school. So when they're getting ready to come to school, they're upset because they don't know where they're going to live when they get off that bus that afternoon. So they don't know. And, um, and so when they go to first period of class, they're really not in the mood for a teacher to tell them to put their, take their head off the desk or, uh, you know, you can't talk to someone or whatever. And so they react and respond. And, and as a dean, you have to find out what's going on with, with this person, with this young person who, who's upset about it. So not having stable housing, not having that place to go is a tremendous issue for our community and for our young people. They don't have a place to stay. They do not work well when they don't know uh, that they have another place to go to uh, in that. So our workforce housing program is, is not the same group of people uh, that uh, Mr. Singh works with. However, we would love to partner. I made a note here of, about some of the, the issues of literacy education. We have community centers that can probably be utilized for those types of programs to help them. But we want people to go into workforce housing. In District 7, most of my, over 54% of everyone who lives in my district are renters. And so it is great to have that housing. It is great to have a place for people to stay, but it also changes this dynamic of this neighborhood because it has not always been so. This, these were the neighborhoods where, where you know, families and everybody lived and all of the children grew up in and they had 
created a bond in these neighborhoods. And now you see that the neighborhoods are turning into mostly rental uh, properties uh, and, and rental units. And so establishing home ownership and creating the opportunities for home ownership, I am looking for that, that to help stabilize that rental market that's coming into my district. Uh, our housing initiative is for the entire city. It's gonna go for the entire city because right now we, most of our lanes are in parks and that sort of thing. So we don't have like vacant parcels just out there waiting for us to develop. So we have to be more creative with what we have. You know, I tell people about the uh, piece of property that's down here that's, that's a huge parking lot. You know, you, you can't have huge parking lots that are just parking lots anymore. Uh, and all they do is park cars Monday through Friday and Saturdays and Sundays, they are vacant. You have to be able to utilize your property and utilize your assets in a different way. And so I'm excited about that task force because we put on there people who were in the know about housing and how we could move forward in making sure that just making that little dent and affordable housing. We are also not against the rental market. If there's an opportunity for us to get housing, I, you know, a personal note here, I, I come from a, a community in Century where you had one of the highest poverty rates in the state of Florida when I was growing up in Century, Florida. Uh, our house was a house that you could see the stars at night uh, and it was cold where in the winter time even though we don't have cold winters, you know, uh, a bottle of water would freeze. So the housing has become a passion of mine to make sure that we can ensure that type of stability, better home ownership. And you don't have to have the brand new house. I know some of the people I talked to about housing, if you, you cannot have a, uh, a penny job and, and looking at, uh, a house that for uh, that's a million dollar job. You, you can't do that. So if, if you only have X number of dollars and when you go looking for a house and your dreams and your desires are just uh, for this dream house that you want, we have to start small. You have to start with that starter home first. And then once you start with that starter home, we kind of build up to the house uh, that we really want. And people do do that. That's the way they used to do it years ago. You didn't start out with the house that you wanted right off. You kind of started with the starter home, knew that you were going to be there, you know, five to 10 years. Maybe you're going to be there until the children got old enough. Uh, to, to, but then you went and you looked for another house. So we kind of have to bring people's expectations back to where uh, we can be more effective in finding homes. And so that's basically what uh, I have in reference to our housing initiative and our housing program. Uh, for the city right now. We have to remember when you look at our housing budgets, whether or not you look at the housing budgets for the county or whether or not you look at them for the city, in the past, those dollars did not come from those general funds at all, but whether it was for the county or whether it was for the city. Normally your housing always came from either your SHIP programs, from the state, from your HUD and federal programs, CDBG, all of those from federal governments. There was not this idea that the counties or the city had a responsibility for the housing of citizens. And we just need to change that. There is a responsibility and we need to kind of coordinate and work together with partners to do, uh, to improve that and improve that vision. Because, you know, housing, this problem cannot be done just with a government fix. It's just not going to be done with a governmental fix. It has to include our private partners, our organizational par uh, partners, uh, developers, uh, contractors. Everyone has to come in. I know in Durham, North, I think it's Durham, North Carolina, our former um, city manager, Tom Barnfield, they have... Um, they have went out and stepped out on a, a great housing initiative for Durham. And the whole county bought into this housing initiative. And so they've created a type of funding that the citizens have, have agreed to pay 
to address housing. So we will need to be able to, to look at housing as a whole. It, it will stabilize our community. It will stabilize our county. So I any questions? So Marcy, do you have any, any, any follow up? Well, well, we do have some questions. Thank you both for that. And, and Councilwoman, I think I'll direct the first one to you since you're already unmuted. There was one that was specifically addressed to you and it talks about, um, it says for Councilwoman, how do, how do programs like Pensacola Habitat have been created in affordable units since 1981 get created with land in a constant challenge? You talked earlier about you just can't have a parking lot so what, what, what do you see are some particular things that can be done uh, in this particular area? Uh, what, what you normally would do is, is you would connect to partners. Uh, you would do normally private developers. You will look at them because, of course, when you do private developers, everyone's looking for some type of profit margin. You know, you're not going to be able to say even profit because people are not going to invest in something that they're not you know, going to be able to see a return on, but you can offer that type of return in reference to uh, being creative about uh, turning parking lots into uh, multi-use uh, facilities where you have mixed use at the bottom where businesses are there, and then you have uh, housing on top of those, and so you can create an environment not only that's that's advantageous to the neighborhood and create strong neighborhoods and provide resources, but also gives that private developer an opportunity as well to, to show a profit because they're just not going to come in it just because of, you know, the kindness of their hearts. They want some type of, of, of profit uh, and what that profit margin is. So you have to offer something. You have to offer some type of help. Sometimes it's incentives. Sometimes it is maybe a um, an e-date where, where they get a tax exemption. Some of those types of things, all of those things play a role in how we, we are able to get that type of housing. Uh, there was a house uh, uh, above on, Mount, on, on uh, Marino Street. When we talk about rent, that uh, it was a three bedroom, two bath house uh, that was renting for $1,400. And so everybody looking at the house, even with a hood voucher, it was $1,400. And they still could not afford to rent that house. And it was not one house, and this is about the PHS area, there was not one house at the time, and this was about last summer, that was renting under $1,200. And one of them was a two bedroom. So we, we will have to deal with, with, with the, the housing and the rent, but the more housing that comes on, uh, the smaller the uh, amount of people that need will eventually, I hope, reduce housing because you become a competitive, not in the way in which we do it now. There are very few uh, opportunities available. There are very few houses that are affordable. And so the market drives that price. That's that is how that works. The market drives, you have this high demand, and therefore that high demand drives these prices. An infusion of more affordable housing, an infusion of more ability to even rental units, you would hope that it would drive down the, the, those prices. Thank you for that answer there, uh, Councilwoman. I, I can tell you there's a ton of questions coming in some of these questions I'm skipping over because I'm going to bring A back in in a few short minutes, but I'm trying to make sure that I direct the questions that are directly asked to you all. One of, as, as a task force, talk to us about the barriers that the task force is facing when addressing these six areas of concern that you're looking at trying to uh, implement. You talked about engaging, you talked about collaborating. What barriers or obstacles as citizens potentially we can do to help alleviate? Thank you. Marcy? Well, as um, from just a partnership standpoint, really just having people willing to come to the table and talk and begin to develop the strategies that we're going to use to move forward. Also, from the um, private sector, obviously, as we're looking for incentives that truly are going to help spur the development of affordable housing, we're going to want to have the um, 
that further sector at the table, giving us some guidance, giving us some information as to what we're working on. So, Councilwoman and, and, and Marcia, since you all are in the same room, was one of the other speaking, if you don't mind muting, that way we can make sure we don't get the echo. And, and also, Marcia, when you're talking, you might want to turn your mic back up a little bit, because I think we may have missed what you said. I got I got probably about 60% of that, but it's... Okay. Okay. So right now, Marcia, I, I don't see, we don't hear you at all. Jewel, is it is it possible you can catch it or? Hey, go ahead, Marcia. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, basically, I'm We lost you, Marcia. Are you still there? Can you say something again? We lost your sound altogether. Hmm. So if, if, you, if you don't mind, we may, we may pivot here a little bit. Save that answer. See if we can get tech support in. Maybe, maybe log out and log back in. And, and we'll pivot a little bit if you don't mind until we can get your, your mic under, uh, fixed or I'm not sure what exactly happened. With. So, so Councilwoman, we... We were talking about um, in your six things you talked about the inventory, and I just want to make sure you talked about being creative about it. I just want to make sure that what you said was there's not a there's not a surplus of inventory that the city has right now in order to build the single family or to address this workforce issue, this workforce issue, and you just want to find more creative ways of that. I want to make circle back to that to make sure that we touch on that. If you would unmute yourself, Councilwoman. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. First of all, when you drive around town, especially when I'm driving around my area, I see old um, businesses. They've been vacant for 20 years. They've been vacant there. Um, how can we use that building? How can that building be turned into housing? Uh, Again, you're looking at different ways to, to address housing versus if you have a small lot, uh, is it a, are you able to put a, a 700 you know, square feet house on this little small lot, maybe a one bedroom on the small lot versus you know, looking for something that you may want to do multi-story or something. So, taking advantage of some of those types of things because we do have a lot of vacant spaces, vacant spaces that have been um, unoccupied for years. And if you have a warehouse, how can the warehouse be turned into something that, that's going to be a housing unit or, or, or more units? So that's, that's what I'm talking about is thinking, you know, kind of out of the box. The other thing is, is uh, because of density, you may want to go up. If you build in a complex, instead of building a single story complex, you may want to build three stories. Um, you probably won't go no higher than that when you're dealing in neighborhoods so that it'll fit in. But instead of building a single story, why not build three stories so that you can have more than just that one family living there? But, a, uh, but it turns into a multiple family complex versus just a single family. So we have to take advantage of our density. We have good density uh, ordinances here within the city of Pensacola. So we have to take advantage of those things that allow us to go up because when you don't have out and you don't have enough to expand, the only place that we have to go is up. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Mr. Abe, I'm also gonna bring you back into this discussion. We do have several questions, but I want you to have the opportunity to chime in on some of them because I think maybe perhaps you can answer as well. But I do uh, want to circle back. They're, they're coming in and people are liking them, so I'll, be, I'll look at one and then all of a sudden it'll pop up something else. So there's one I like particularly. It says, has there been any discussion around accessible housing? If so, how will this be addressed? uh accessible housing i, I don't know wh what the the question is that's what we are addressing now we're addressing affordable housing right. 
I don't know if the if the uh, originator of that question uh, is is uh -huh. go ahead. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh huh. Go ahead. <laughs> I, 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 in the meantime, Marcia, you you kind of yeah. did the accessible housing is talking about um, people who have different yeah. challenges with buildings and things of that nature. Yeah, actually, um, Carolyn Growey, the executive director for Center for Independent Living, is one of the members on our task force. And one of the things that she came out with as an overarching goal for the task force was that they um, the, all the strategies and all the incentives prioritize equity, accessibility, and affordability. So make sure that as we are building, especially when we're building multifamily and those kinds of complexes, that there is that component for accessibility. But even as we're looking to build some of maybe our single family units, to take the accessibility features into consideration, you know, something as simple as if you go ahead and fit out a unit where there's extra structural components like in the restroom areas and stuff. So at that point where maybe you want to put in grab bars or things like that, it's not a complete rehab or redo of the of the unit. It's something that's accessible for those families. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, for that. And while you're there, I mean, you and A probably can um, answer this question for me. It says, are there any programs designed to transition people out of subsidized housing? Well, for the Section 8 program, actually what happens is as a family reaches what we call self-sufficiency, which means they're paying all their rent plus utilities. For six months, they continue to have their voucher in place just to make sure that they really are stable. Then at the end of that period, their um, voucher is expired. They're no longer a participant on the voucher program. So that is kind of a natural transition out of that um, Housing Choice Voucher Program. I have a comment there. I, I have a comment on it. Yes, you, you have to talk to me clear when you say accessory. You know, I'm, I'm handicap accessibility, all those types of things. You have to be clear with me because I'm not. I'll do, I'll do those that. are new terms that are. Okay. The transitioning people out of, of housing, I, I've been doing some research and, and I'm still working on the research. In the housing and public housing or any type of housing, uh, you should not be in the housing for 20 to 30 years. I, I mean, there's, there has to be an education program where, again, we go back to you start off here at this point because many people start out renting. So I start out renting, you know, I'm going to be renting for five or 10 years or maybe till I can get in a position. Then I look for, you know, housing. So what I have seen recently is that you get uh, people who stay in the housing, you know, for the 20 or 30 years, then their grandchildren come around and they stay. So their children and their children, and their grandchildren, everybody come. And, and so the idea here is to, for the next generation of people to own a home or the next generation to, to pro, uh, progress better in that. And so that is an education of that expectation is just very, very important. How are we gonna get that in there? I don't know at the moment. Um, I haven't talked with Marcia or the task force about that or you know, Mr. You know, Mr. Singh about any of that, but that education piece and the expectation of, of getting those things that you want uh, is, is better. I, I remember I telling someone that my godmother, we, she had a jar and she had one of those old canning jars. And every time she wanted something and she didn't have the money for all of her change and everything would go in the canning jar. And so over a period of time, when she went back there, it wasn't like the bank because she didn't go to a bank. You know, she didn't, she didn't deal with the bank. So over a period of time, you know, after a year or so, she went there to her canning jar and she had put down what she wanted on, you know, what to want it. And then she went back to that canning jar and the savings and everything was there for her, her to get started with something. And so given this idea that a part of the education, a part of the whole literacy idea of home ownership is very, very important. How are we going to merge that? I don't know, because sometimes that becomes a very touchy issue for people. Um, they don't really want to discuss uh, that they are supposed they're transitioning into uh, a better housing situation uh, for them. So sometimes that can get kind of touchy for some, 
but I think it's a conversation that needs to be had. Yeah. Uh, Councilwoman, you have uh, you have talked about the 500 homes in five years, but from your dialogue you just gave me, it also speaks to not just housing, you're talking about breaking generational poverty. Uh, and so you're really looking at this from a, a larger perspective. The housing aspect is, is, is one, one little point inside of it, which stabilizes um, that individual family. And so you want to look a little bit deeper. And I say all that to say, because I think it, this is a great segue into another, another question that was asked. It says, how do we create a more accessible, diverse workforce in our community that allows folks to cultivate wealth and grow upward instead of remaining stagnant? Okay, now that, that's a very hard question because we have to begin to change cultural norms. Those cultural norms that have occupied us or uh, ahead us for the last 50 few years. Our community, you know, and African American, we're the biggest consumers. Mm -hmm. You know, we 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 are consumers. We get a dollar, we spend that dollar. So we need to to uh, not only do we spend that dollar, you don't necessarily spend the dollar in the community where the money is going to turn over in our community. So when you're talking about how do you create wealth, wealth is with owning a home. Uh, I've always saw wealth is owning a home. Wealth appreciates. It does not depreciate like that car that you went and you spend $600 a month on uh, for that car. So again, the whole culture aspect of what we value as important. If we value home ownership as important, then we will need to take steps to do that. If we value wealth, uh, another one of our areas for our community is small businesses. Right now, small businesses are taking a really big hit because of COVID. So again, those opportunities in which to, um, to gain wealth can come from small businesses. But when you just started out, uh, my first job was working in the field making $5 a day. You know, my second job, when they talked about uh, the minimum wage, I remember the job was $2.10 an hour. Uh, when I was in the military, my first paycheck that I brought home uh, after taxes was $168 every two weeks. So we start at a point in our lives, and then we say these are the things that, that we want in our lives. And yes, our journey will have hiccups, our journeys will have children, and other things that go along in there. But that journey should include some important things. Education is one. You know, you have to be trained in there. Someone told me um, my, uh, they didn't want to do cut grass and everything. I said, there's no problem in cutting grass. I said, why don't you just have the grass cut in business so that you can create a business to cut grass so that you can create the wealth so that you can hire someone so that you can have your own home. So that education important uh, uh, part in our community is going to be a, a, an important part, as well as looking at how our labor force has changed. Our labor force has changed in the community. We need to go to, into that labor force, whether it's cybersecurity, computer technology, aviation, all of those things that pay those, those wages that are livable wages. So we start at a point, then we move up, and that expectation is should, that we do move up. Hey, do you have anything that you want to chime in on that? What are you seeing from your perspective, families, and how are you changing the behavior norm that needs to be addressed? Well, uh, uh, you know, HUD's intentional uh, public housing was never meant to be permanent housing. Uh, uh, when uh, in the 1930s, when public housing was first introduced, it was a stepping stone for individuals and families, as uh, as Council Lady Jewel had mentioned. Uh, it was just a stepping stone for them to, uh, you know, own or, or 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 towards ownership. But I think we are dealing with so many tensions, such as education, and I have these six things that I would like to share very quickly. We should bring education, high school completion, GED completion on the campuses of public housing to my residents. We have community centers, 
uh, that can accommodate classroom settings right now. Uh, we had, uh, uh, we had uh, f uh, at one time we had three Head Start programs through community action, but because of uh, funding cuts, we lost all three Head Start programs. Uh, we, should, we should bring family education into public housing. Uh, and most importantly, we should bring uh, a child care program uh, to, to, you know, to public housing so our mothers and fathers can go out and get the training and get the job while, while, while we are babysitting the children in an educational setting. Of course, obviously, we need more low-cost housing. And, and the last one for all of us, the city and the county and the state government should come together collectively and begin to understand the problems that public housing and nonprofit organizations are faced with. And we should work together with all of our government uh, you know, entities from the city, from the county, and up to the state. Thank you for that, sir. Appreciate that. Um, Councilwoman, uh, the design overlay has been hindering the development of some affordable housing. How do you plan to address this in order to be successful in your plan? Uh, currently, uh, the design overlay, if a person is having a problem with the overlay, they should contact the CRA and the CRA will address their issues. We hired a consultant over for a year a year or two to make sure that if we had to tweak the uh, the overlay, we would be able to tweak the overlay. Uh, however, if you go into any other areas, you just can't put anything in our, in the African American neighborhood that is not conducive, that's not uh, a part of that neighborhood, and change that neighborhood. We want our neighborhoods to look like our neighborhoods. We don't want suburban development. At least I don't want suburban development to come in and take over the character and essence of our neighborhoods. And that is what happened. You have suburban designs want to come in and just put them all over our neighborhood. If there are problems with the basic requirements of that, then they can go to the CRA and be able to, to get those things addressed. We have a list of those. They're going to come back and we're going to talk about them because of course we want everything to be fair. Uh, it is not something, but we want also our neighborhoods to be developed uh, in the way in which it creates good and positive neighborhoods. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to mention was because I heard in you all's talk, you talked a little bit about the, the missing middle housing. You talked about duplexes, triplexes, walkable type things. My, my question to you, and as the, as the 500 homes and the five years campaign is going on, is that something that you all are open to, or is the city or the county maybe open to that, that suggestion of going back and reaching that in those middle houses, those duplexes, perhaps the ones that look like they're a normal house, but you would have two or three families living there? Uh, we're going to, the city is going to hire a housing coordinator. So there will be someone that's going to be focused on, on housing um, in this, area. Uh, when we talk about the HUD housing, when we talk about Section 8, those people are paid out of a different pot of dollars. And so therefore their focus is on those particular areas. This particular project and other project, housing projects, we need to kind of bring some type of centralization to the goals of housing. We include all of those, but we need one person and there will be a person that will be able to look at the housing uh, stock and opportunities as a whole for the whole city. So we're hoping that that one person uh, that will be able to do that and help us connect the dots and look at all opportunities. Uh, you got to look at all opportunities here uh, for housing. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, ma'am. I'm circling through trying to see if I have another question here. Uh, here's, a, here's a profound one. I, I, I don't, I haven't seen this before, so I want to ask you, it says, when will improvements to things like sidewalks or resources catch up to the development of new homes in rapidly developing Pensacola communities? 
Uh, the sidewalk issue is, is a major uh, issue for the community. Uh, some areas you have sidewalks. The first step that we have to do is look at a sidewalk policy. We have a policy now that we have people who can opt out of a sidewalk in their neighborhood, which is not conducive to the flow uh, and the, the flow of, of sidewalks. We also have sidewalks that are already down, already built, but are not wide enough. They do not meet a standard. So I did some research in, in, through Texas and all other cities to, to create a sidewalk program all together for a size city of the city of Pensacola. We're, we're talking about 230 to you know, 300 million dollars. This is millions of dollars to do sidewalk. So the conversation has to be had is how should sidewalks, um, where should sidewalks be? Uh, creating a ordinance or a policy that addresses, you know, if you're going to get a sidewalk, no one can opt out of the sidewalk. But we have some people who don't want sidewalks. So whether or not sidewalks should be in all of the neighborhoods or should they just connect major areas? Should they just connect to major resources, whether it's a park, whether it's a pharmacy, whether it's the hospital? So all of these questions have to be addressed and then going out for the funding for this and creating that plan. And that plan has not been created. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, this question is uh, circles back to Abe. Abe, you brought up some things that you want to see inside of the public housing sector. And the question is, is are the families ready for those particular resources that you, you're proposing to bring back into public housing? And if they are not, how do we get them ready for those to accept those particular resources? And you're muted in case you're talking. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. We have a lot of families that are requesting for these uh, services to be, in, uh, to be introduced. Uh, we also have uh, a handful of families uh, that will need tremendous amount of encouragement uh, and, 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 and speaking with to, 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 to accept these types of responsibilities and to act on these services positively. So, so, so we have two groups of individuals or families. One, uh, you know, one family is already asking for this and the other ones will need a lot of coaching. We are able to get our mother's, uh, you know, summer employment uh, 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 at the hotels on the beach and all the hotels here, but there is no way for them to be transported uh, to their, 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 uh, uh, in a place for, uh, for employment. And, and, uh, and again, transportation is a huge, uh, uh, you know, conduit to what we're talking about, uh, Al. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that. I, I want to make sure, because we're wrapping up here, I wanted to make sure I give each and every one of you an opportunity to close out um, today's summit. So if you, if you don't mind, Councilwoman Wynn, do you have anything that you would like to add prior to closing out? The only thing is thank you very much uh, for uh, allowing me to be a part of this. It's important. The dialogue is important. I would like for Mr. Singh to send me his list so that I, I can pass that list on. But also that the affordable housing project is only a small portion of the many needs that we need. It's only one step. There, got to, there has to be other steps that go along with that. And I asking the community to help me work with that so that we can take that step and move forward to others. Thank you, Councilwoman. I really appreciate you giving us your time and energy and effort and insight today. It, Marcia, are you able? Or is your uh, mic? Come on, ready? Marcia. Uh -huh, come on. Well, while, while you're getting settled in, Marcia, I'm going to circle back to Abe. Abe dropped us a list of about six things and make sure Abe, you do kind of send that list over to us. That way, uh, if people have questions about them, we make sure we share them with you. So Abe, you give us your part of the comments, please, sir. Oh, okay. Can you hear me, Al? All of a yes, sudden sir. I lost contact with everybody. Yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay, great. So yes, I will, I, I will send the list to uh, uh, Council Lady uh, uh, Canada. And, 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 uh, and this has been a very invigorating uh, conversation amongst all of us, and and uh, and uh, and I encourage uh, 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 to move further with this now, and let's let's uh, let's uh, let's begin to work 
at at uh, at the problems that are there are uh, uh, you know impeding us and facing us, and and uh, and let's look for uh, you know solutions uh, from all of the organization, including all of the governmental agencies as well. Well, thank you, sir. We, we definitely appreciate you for bringing your your insight onto today's summit. Uh, again, thank you very much, and I, I I am very humbled by you blessing us with your presence, but also by you just being being encouraging us and telling us to make sure we just don't reduce this to to talk. We want to make sure we move forward with our efforts in this in this challenge that we're facing as a as a city as a population. I, I do have. Marcy, you're, you're set for your closing? I am. I am. Just thank you so much for having myself and the council president on today. I really appreciate the opportunity to share what the city's putting in place with the community at large. Um, and thank you to those members in the community who have signed on and are listening too. We will be making outreach to the community for support as we move forward. Like the council president said, we're hoping to hire a position. And one of their main focuses is going to be the implementation of the goals that we come out with, of with the um, task force. So just thank you again. And thank you to Habitat for the service you provide to our community. Thank you, Marcy. Definitely appreciate you for being here. We appreciate all the people who attended this summit today. We appreciate all the participants, all the questions you sent us. We just want to thank you for participating in our annual summit. We look forward to bringing you something a little bit more often because we know that this is an issue that, that needs to be addressed and we need to make sure, like Councilwoman Canada Wynn said a little earlier, we want to make sure we progress that momentum. We have a number. We have things that are on the table that we are addressing. So we want to make sure that, that we as at Habitat help those things be addressed and, and be a part of the, the discussion, at least facilitating the discussion and talk. One of the things that came out today that I really, really enjoyed, there's several things that you all talked about, but that creating an adaptive system in order to move from a complicated to a complex, I think we're on the right track. I really do have this feel that as a, as a, as a community, we are addressing these issues and on the right track about identifying the needs, identifying the concerns. There's just a few things, the tweaks that here and there. I think we should we should make sure we address, which will allow us to leverage our resources a whole lot better. Make sure that when when Abe and, and the area housing have some issues over there that we are already working for solving or resolving those issues. Make sure that Nanny works when they, they have a family who they are trying to help. Perhaps they don't go through a year and a half of trying to make sure they get stable housing. Things of that nature are, are those things that really hinder us from getting to the next step as far as stable housing and making sure that families are in a position to break that generational poverty. So on behalf, on behalf of my wonderful team who, who pulled this off for us today and on behalf of Pensacola Habitat, I, I really thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for participating today again. If you send that information or send an email to info at PensacolaHabitat.org, if you want a copy of the live recording, uh, we will definitely send it out to you. With that, I'll say have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much.